Welcome back to Macro Dosing. It is Thursday. Mad Dog's already laughing. We've got a new special guest host right now. It's Jake Marsh. Jake, thank you for joining us. Thank on the you program. guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Just wanted to get you on here. I know that you're doing some big things in the merch department these yes. days. So everyone's calling you. I saw somebody say Jake Merch. Oh, That's I like your new that. name. Yeah. So we're gonna make sure that everybody uses the code. Get the fuck out of here. Wait, no, 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 okay. Billy, no, Billy, no, Billy, no, this is bullshit. Billy. I just invited Jake to come in. Can, you, can we just get on with the episode? Billy, have a seat real quick. No, yes. This is Jake, you're fine. If you want to disincentivize me from ever doing well at my job, this is the perfect way to do <laughs> no, it. No, you're not going to so, use that. So, yeah. You're not going to use that. that once again, that, that, that promo code. I mean, you are getting carried. Is Jake. Okay. I didn't ask for this. Uh, Billy, I'm Billy, not begging anyone. No, d Jake didn't I, ask I mean, for this. If you're fine with winning it that way, then fine. But yeah, of course. Billy, I'm, am I you still should. in first? Yeah, Billy's in first place now. Great. G congratulations, Billy. Also, yeah. Jake, before you came in here, Billy was like, I, it's fine. I'm totally zinned out now. Like, I don't even care about this merch contest. And uh, I think that was a lie. Uh, well, then verbal I got verbal meme, again. Tyler, the creator. So that was a fucking lie. Whatever. I don't care anymore. No, you don't care. <laughs> it's <laughs> you're you're so you just code Billy. Well, here's the you're, thing. If you're against foreign election interference, <laughs> here's, vote code Billy. Here's the thing is, uh, Jake... Jake constantly promotes others and never asks for anything. And we need okay, to so then return the favor to, to Jake. Just give it to him. Billy, if Why you entered this conversation him? with let's make a deal because first and second get 23 <laughs> pay I don't deal combined. I've been all morning pushing the so have I. and working. Yes. And I'm You've in first great by job. my own accord, not using the part of my take account. I didn't tweet from the part of my take Who account. Who tweeted from the part of my take account? I don't account? know. Hmm. I have not begged hmm. anyone to tweet anything. You think, you think Jake would do that? Jake would never do that. Hmm. Mm. Billy, <laughs> Billy accusing me of lying is, yeah. is something. <laughs> I, I love how Billy's carrying the mic can stand just, around the room like, Billy, like he's Anthony Kiedis. What? <laughs> like I'm what? Like you're the yeah, singer of the Chili the Peppers. <laughs> no. Billy, the way this is going, who are you going to text to ask what time we're recording now? Yeah. Memes. You're burning texting. your own bridge. <laughs> you know what? Can we just get on with the show? We don't have to talk. I like was so zen a second ago. I was like, I don't care about the competition. But now Jake, Jake's sitting in my seat. We can't start the show. No, at PFT's request. Yeah, at, Jake, at my request, I invited Jake in here. Um, Jake, we're going to talk about Enron today. Just Enron wondering. Field? Used to be I love you, the Jake. Astros. I love I love you so much, Jake. Before Minute Maid, it was Enron. Yes, that's all I know about there, it. That Just, that is the that's the most pure hey, Jake March hey. moment. I went to the 2004 <laughs> All Star Game, and. It was Enron Field. Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about the company Enron? Nope. Okay. Just, just that the Astros just that the old field. stadium. <laughs> Billy, what are you doing? You're taking. <laughs> Billy's quitting the podcast <laughs> because we're not promoting. His <laughs> I've been there a time or two. Billy is 14 years old, and that's yeah. being generous. Um, no, Enron was a company in Texas. It was an energy company. Okay. That ended up going bankrupt and collapsing. All their stock price went down. Um, Tens of thousands of people lost their job, and it was like one of the biggest instances of corporate fraud oh, wow. in American history because what they did was they deregulated the energy markets in California. And so what you could do is you could, uh, if you're a company that was based out of state, you could tell power plants in California, you could buy their energy directly from them so that it wouldn't go out to the homes and, and the families and the businesses that need it in California. Somebody could come in from out of state, buy all that energy straight up, mm -hmm. and then redirect it to other states so California wouldn't have any energy at all. People would lose their air conditioning, lose all the electricity in their houses, and then the price of energy through supply and demand would go way up because if you're in your house and it's 100 degrees outside, you don't have air conditioning, people are willing to pay uh, 10, 20, even 100 times as much for electricity to get that electricity in their houses. And so it put it, it put like uh, people that were working in California, living in California, their energy bills were like $6,000 a month. Got it. People that couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, and so then uh, what Enron would do would be artificially create that demand. And then once the price went up, finally give them the electricity. But they actually weren't, they weren't creating a product that was useful. And it ended up actually getting the, um, the governor recalled from his job and that's why arnold schwarzenegger became governor of california wow. seems complex it is a complex yeah situation so there we're gonna, strippers too there were strippers too we're gonna get into a lot more of it um that's kind of the the three minute thirty thousand foot overview 
Um, but Enron Field. Yep. Yes. Enron Field. That's yep. my biggest takeaway. I didn't Enron know that. Fields. Yeah. When they were in the NL, yeah. Yep. And they had a cooler logo. That's true. That's before they were cheaters. Yeah. Ironically, right. their, should, their name should I'm gonna be Enron now. I'm going to give Billy his seat back, yep. but uh, code Jake. <laughs> Promo code Jake. Promo Thank code you, Jake. Jake. 10% off. 10% off. Sorry, Thank, you. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you for having me. That was fantastic. What a good start to today's episode. Today's episode, Billy, do you know what it's brought to you by? Jackasses. <laughs> today's episode is brought to you by Jackasses. Um, no, today's episode is actually brought to you by our great friends at Game Time. It's Tennessee week. Let's give it up for Tennessee. Fired up. If you're Rocky looking to, to go to the former Enron Field, now Minute Maid Park for a game, or if you're looking to go to the Tennessee Volunteers game against Florida, I know a great way to do that. That's by going to Game Time. Game Time is the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. If you use promo code MACRO, you get 20 bucks off your first purchase. Download Game Time, last minute tickets, lowest price is guaranteed. We use Game Time. We've been using it all year. We went to some uh, Caps Rangers game. Going to have to get back into the barn soon. Go to MSG, go to the Mecca. Check out some more hockey. I'm going to MSG tonight. Let's go. What's at MSG? Harry Styles. Harry Styles. If you want to get close to game time or to Harry Styles, use game time. Billy, do you want to finish up this ad read? I'm distracted. What have you used game time for recently? Billy? Oh, I'm going to, I'm hopefully going to a concert next week using game time. Okay. So I'm pumped. Yeah. And if you use promo code macro, you can get 20 bucks off your first purchase. Some terms apply. Just go to the app, download it. It's the best places, but best place to find the best deals, the easiest user, user interface, the lowest prices, best seats guaranteed. I'll tell That's you what. Game time, baby. I'll tell you what about game time. I want to go see Aaron Judge hit his 61st and 62nd home runs. Ticket prices are expensive. Not with game time. Not with game time. Not with game time. Get in the door for, for less. That's what they say. Especially if you use code macro. Code macro, 20 bucks off your first purchase. So about that Aaron Judge thing. Those kids. That is the worst trade deal wait, 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 in the no, history him, of trade deals. I want to hear what he has to say, but those kids are dumb. Okay, yeah, we can get to the kids in a second. I was um, going to say, you didn't, you weren't going to go for the kids yet. No, oh. I was going to say, like, he plays in a Mickey Mouse stadium. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, you could say that, but, like, Fenway's a Mickey Mouse stadium. There's a lot of Mickey Mouse stadiums, for sure. Yeah, but he, it's the most Mickey of the Mouse stadiums. Is it? Yeah. Mm. For sure. The launching pad? I don't know. I'm in the middle of a deep dive right now to figure out. I'm using that Would It Dong Twitter account. Do you know that one? Yeah. So every home run that's hit, I bet Big T's a big fan of the Would It Dong. Love it. Yeah, it's a great There's account. nothing worse than when someone on your team just rips one to like dead center and it's called at the wall and then it's like, this was a home run in 29 of the 30 ballparks. Yep, yep. So that's what it does. It, it measures every home run and it tells you based on the dimensions of the field that it was hit on um, if it would have gone out of the park in other – uh, Major League Baseball stadiums, and if so, how many of the 30 stadiums? So I'm going to go back, do a deep dive on Aaron Judge's home run count, and see exactly how many were assisted by the Mickey Mouse ballpark that is the new Yankee Stadium. In fairness, his numbers are inflated. Obviously, it's a shorter ballpark than most, but at the same time, it's like his numbers are way more than anybody else's. They're also giving him an Albert Pujols juice balls. Yeah, so, well, only those two are getting him. Okay. I was Is at, that what we're saying? I was in St. Louis several weeks ago when the Braves were there, and Pujols hit a ball that was, I mean, a routine pop-up to shallow left field that kept carrying and carrying and carrying. It was caught at the warning track. But it was uh, – I, I couldn't believe it. They're giving mm. them juice balls, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Um, they might be. I think for Pujols, yes. For Aaron Judge, I think it's steroids. Could be. Okay. Let's oh, just talk about it. I actually, can't be genetics? No, I actually don't think that it's steroids, but I, I want to get those takes. How come nobody has had that take yet about Aaron Judge? Because he, cause he's been that big for too long. Yeah, I know. He's, he's just a big guy. It's like one of those things where it's like you look at him in middle school, and it's like that guy wasn't doing steroids in middle school. So according to Billy's official stance on Aaron Judge, you are the steroid expert. He's natty. He, he may have put on a you lot. Said, you said natty? Yeah, he's natty. Okay. Um, for those of people out there that might not know what natty means, what is that? Natural. Mean? Not doing roids. Yeah. What about you can it? tell because he's, he's not coordinated. <laughs> okay. All like, right. Keep like going. When he run, he's, like, he's hitting baseballs 450 feet. But he's not going. No, no. Like if you, you can just tell that he's like, he's built like Miles Garrett. Okay. Like it's that kind of build. 
Just a big boy. Yeah. Just a big boy. Yeah. Um. Oh wow, this is kind of crazy. The very first one that pops up. I just did Would It Dong Aaron Judge search. Uh, June fifteenth. The very first one that pops up. Aaron Judge versus Shane McClanahan. Home run. Exit velocity one hundred four point one miles per hour. Projected distance three hundred sixty four feet. This was a home run at Yankee Stadium and nowhere else. Interesting. So that's one that shouldn't count. I'll be going on a deeper dive, exploring his many, many home runs. Um, and we'll get back to that. We'll, we'll give him an updated. I'd like to see what's the least friendly. It should. Hit, it just shouldn't ballpark. count. It just shouldn't count. It went out of the uh, ballpark. Probably, it shouldn't count. <laughs> probably Detroit. That's what you're saying. Detroit. San Diego is not up there anymore, right? They changed the dimensions, I think, in San Diego. Um, that used to be, like, the worst one. For Ryan to hitters, now it's probably Baltimore, too. Oh, yeah, they, they yeah. raised the wall. They but built I think that De- wall. Detroit is huge, and there's no real reason for it. To, like, Coors is huge, but it's because there's no, there's no air, air resistance. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think it's probably Detroit. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a projection on what Aaron Judge actually would have hit had he played in a real ballpark like Comerica. Got it. it Yankee called? Stadium. Isn't a real ballpark. Not a real People ballpark. People don't pay to go there. No. And don't use game ballpark. time to go Mickey, there. Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Got Mickey it. Mickey Mouse. You go to Orlando. City yeah. Field, too, is really big. City Field is big, yeah. That pissed me off when Acuna hit that ball oh, straight away center field. I'll never forget that. Probably like 404 feet. It was it, – we all bet Ronald did a home run, and he just destroyed a ball. Like I said earlier, on the like dead center. I actually remember the expected batting average was 1,000. Meaning there had never been a ball <laughs> hit with that exit velocity and that far that wasn't a hit. Yep. Only it, for us. And we Ari- would have won a collective Arian like three put, grand. Arian put $200 on it. He was going to win like 900 Sucks. That is tough. Um, I, I am starting to dive deeper into the metrics right now, and I'm seeing that this might this might not be a case of Mickey Mouse entirely. Yep. Not Makes entirely. Sense. Makes sense. It's a real ballpark. You know what's Mickey Mouse? What? The kid not taking money and saying he wanted nothing because of how much Aaron Judge has given to the organization. That yeah. was bad. So his 60th ball, yep. 60th home run, uh, it gets caught by like a group of kids somehow. It was weird. So if you watch the video in slow-mo, it bounces. It, I think it hit the top of the bullpen and it bounced like far left. And the kid actually... It hit somebody and came right back to him, and he caught it. And there was a huge dog pile, but he wasn't even in the dog pile. He actually grabbed it and jetted out of there. So he, oh, so so he, people were under the dog pile thinking the ball was there. He was already gone. Oh, he already went up the bleachers. You know what would have been hilarious if you dropped a fake ball to distract. If you wrote not the actual judge ball on it, then just threw it, and yeah, like, <laughs> so that they would know. I'm just glad Zach Hample didn't get it. But what if wait wait you would bad. be smart if you just pretended yours was the ball and they had no way of telling. If you like put the uh, MLB mark on it, I think they do have a way. I think at this point, when it's balls like that, there. Uh, I said they were using juice balls. I think they do use specially marked balls because I remember A Rod's three thousandth hit had a little mark yeah. on it they were switching them every at bat yeah i think they do i don't know if they were doing it for this one but they do at some points do that yeah they do uh it, it, but it, if you were to just try to exchange it to the team the team might not have the authenticators right there all the time right no they do they do the, like, they have one in the dugout they do okay in case it's like somebody's debut and they get their first hit they send it right in there and there's a guy who like puts a sticker on it and everything okay i didn't know that uh, but yeah, so these guys they they traded in and they just said thanks to Aaron Judge for everything he's done for the organization. They gave him autographed baseballs. How what has he done for the organization? Just curious. Avery? He's he, he in two months he might leave. Yeah, what has he done? I'm just curious. I I mean like he's obviously carried the team for a a, a lot of his time. I mean he's been hurt a to lot. What, what has he carried them to? Nothing. Nothing like of substantial. So, yeah, I guess not really that much. This has been his really one true healthy year that he's absolutely dominated, but he hasn't, like, carried. Yeah, he's been a decent player who this year became a great player because he's played the whole season. Correct. Okay. He has the intangibles, but he's also 30 years old, and he's probably going to get $400 million. The the Yankees really fucked up. The Yankees offered him seven years, $213 million before the season started. In fairness, nobody saw this coming. But that's also an insulting offer to a guy who's like been with the organization forever and like thirty million dollars a year. It, 
two thirteen. Now he's going to get way more than that well, yeah. now. But mm-hmm. um, what if the Nats signed him? Oh my god, that'd be so cool. But but those kids, eat, I would have left with the ball and said, "Y'all can negotiate with me later." But I'm not doing anything tonight. Yep, I'm gonna sleep on it. But even if you just so, well, I would have sold it. But even if you just negotiate with the team, I mean, they'd go. You could have for sure gotten tickets to every playoff game, no question. Probably season tickets next year. Any autograph stuff you want, like, and they trade it for like a couple autograph baseballs. It's hmm. insane. Or you could have gotten probably fifty grand. Yeah, that's bad negotiating. To say the least on their part. Big T's right. You get that ball, you go home. Yeah. yeah. I'm not doing you anything tonight. It's another I'm Tom leaving. Brady situation. And, and then, yeah, exactly. Then you put somebody in between you and the team and say, please discuss with my representative. Yeah. And you don't do the negotiation yourself. This you don't a, even have to have a representative. It could be like fake Big account. T. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could be a fake email account that you set up. It exactly. just makes somebody up like like uh, John Barron. Yeah. The guy that uh, Donald Trump made up, right? Yeah. And be like, yeah, talk to my, he's my representative. He does all my deals for me. And then you also write back from that email address. But I'm not going to, I'm not holding anything against these kids. It's not the decision I would have made. I think it's still cool that they did that. Like you can make whatever decision you want, but they probably could have gotten a lot more money from it. That's all. 100%. And even if you didn't want money, like if you really did want to give it back to him, then get all that shit. Yeah. Playoff tickets, all that. Did they get to meet Aaron? I'm, Judge? I'm sure they yeah, did. Yeah, they took a picture. They okay. took a picture with him. That's cool. Also, all right, in this case, though, it's number 60. That's not that important of a ball. It is. It's not that important. Ties Babe Ruth. Ties Babe Ruth. But the second he hits number 61 and 62 and 63. Well, it's like that was the same thing with McGuire and Sosa that you're like when they got to 60, that was the biggest. Then yeah. 60 and then all the way up. 63 to- is the big one, I think. 63 is the one that could go for like substantial. Why three? Well, that passes everybody. That passes everybody that 62. he's... 62. 62 is the one. Because oh, Roger Maris is 61. 61. Right, okay. I'm actually surprised that so many people now are, are saying that, like... Because Bonds hit, what, 70? Yep. And and the trend lately has been, like, who gives a fuck that Barry Bonds did steroids? He was the best, this, that, and the other. And now everybody's acting like 61 is the real home run record. It's the Yankee record. Yes. Right. That's why they care so much about it, because it passes Roger Maris, and that record stood around for a long time. Then we've kind of washed out completely McGuire, Sosa, Barry Bonds. Now, recently, yeah, I think people have come around on Barry Bonds and been like, hey, he's the best to ever play the game. But um, And so if he does hit 71, which he won't. He can't get there. But if he did, if somebody did hit 71, then that would be the big ball. But at this point, I do think that like 62 – is a pretty big deal and then whatever he ends up at will be a big deal too you ever seen the movie 61 billy crystal wasn't that was it, in that the, movie? Does, it billy crystal joint i think he directed it good movie does this ball lose in value as more balls are hit yep yep billy we need some more ball law on this one. Oh yeah that ball kid law that kid had well, no right to that. <laughs> no, they so in baseball they made it that the ball was no longer the team's property because it, they it was a liability if they owned it because mm-hmm. then they could be sued. So I just tapped out of the conversation, add wise. It's okay. Are you what still were mad? We talking about it? No, I had to zen out. So it's, you're not no, mad it's, anymore. I'm not mad. It's just that I li- like I'm I'm what I'm going to do with the money is I'm going to put it a bet all the money on one game and then if it wins I'm going to give all the winnings from that bet to charity. Oh, okay. So, I mean, if you want to line Jake's pocket or donate to charity, like that's when why you know that's you, why I'm winning. When did right? you decide to do that? I tweeted it two hours ago. Wait, but even right. if you won, you'd still be lining your pocket, but you'd be giving the winnings to charity as well, right? You'd be like taking the whatever the fifteen, but you're just giving. The- well, it's gonna be a live stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but your your pockets are still being lined, <laughs> right? He's, he's still yeah. getting the money. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't get it. No, 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 no. I don't. Then, then, is it twenty five or fifteen? I thought then, Hank said it was twenty five. Then if he wins yeah. his bet, then he's going to give the double of the money to charity. Right. But he, you're but still going to get money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Got it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's everyone wins. <laughs> Does everyone win? <laughs> Unless we lose. But it would be a great live. Of the I mean, time, I'm it works literally, every time. I'm literally creating content, charity, and lining winning. your own pockets. But we're just lining Jake's pockets in your case. So if you want to promote that, go for it. Um, but anyway, uh, has anybody seen the New Hampshire Libertarian Party? The stuff they've been posting because it is hilarious. I just want to play I, this. I have seen it. Yeah. Have you seen the commercial? 
Um, is it? No, I just think it's interesting that Billy came up with this, uh, the charity gambling thing aspect after I started to promote Jake's links. No, I promoted, it was one of the first things I did. It's I in th- a video. Yeah, I saw it at 10, 1034. You know how many emails I sent this morning? I thought it was 1034. I sent 5,000 emails this morning. <laughs> so you have a list, you, you click send 5,000 times. I actually have, or did you, you can only wait, send. Wait, wait, here's a question. I clicked it 10 times because okay. you can only send 500 emails at a time. Okay. And right. I did that. So you I sent pro- 10, promoted you sent 10 over, emails. Over, no, but you understand how much caught like <laughs> to five thousand. You know how much work it had taken me to develop. Like I'm just saying, like whatever I doesn't t- matter. T- if, my he cap, win- Billy. if he wins, like you guys carried him over, and it's a Mickey Mouse. Like, but like you know what? Fake I'm ring. taking. I'm Fake taking. Ring. I'm taking a step back. <laughs> I'm in the scheme of things. My life is good. I don't need that. I'm fine. This was a bubble. I'm over competitive. I'm over competitive, and it's coming out. And I don't like bullshit, so it, it pisses me off. But we're here, we're chilling. Um, let's talk about the uh, New Hampshire Libertarians. It is, who are it is hilarious. It is funny to think that um, that like somehow Dave's idea or Hank's idea, who, whose ever it was, of the Merchant Palooza, um, it's working yeah. right now because this is exactly because what they this, wanted. this is just what they wanted was yeah. for somebody like Billy to take it very personally mm-hmm. and to get upset. Sorry, I'm good at my job. God damn! I, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> my weaknesses: I, I work too hard. I, I care too much. I really, Sometimes see, I hit someone. See, with my every car. time I care, I get disincentivized, and then then what? when people get pissed Billy, off at me, Billy, this is not dis. You're winning right now. I know, but it's never enough. <laughs> Billy's mad. That's what separates the great ones. All right, listen to this commercial. Billy, Billy's mad that I'm promoting Jake yes. and. Parasites. I've no, I've never done this anything to help Billy out they're talking, before. They're talking, Scum. They're talking about you and people Bill. coming over our border into our home. Is that me? To destroy what we believe in. <laughs> they're talking. This is about Thugs, New Hampshire addicts, people of Massachusetts <laughs> that don't share our values of liberty, property rights, mm-hmm. and voluntary. I'm Jeremy Kaufman, and if you're out there, please translate this message into Spanish. No way. Interesting. I love, I love that. So, aren't those guys the same guys that we talked about a couple months ago that um, tried to privatize all their schools? They tried to do the Big T method, and all the parents in New Hampshire were like, "What the fuck is going on? How come we have to pay?" They started to have to pay like thousands of dollars to send their kids to public schools. And then the buses weren't running, and then they had to kick the entire party out of their town. Wasn't that the same party that did I that? I have no idea. Wait, let me look that up. But it's, it sounds like it might have been. Uh, but those, uh, yeah, it's a funny commercial. It's hilarious. I love how they're like, <laughs> this is another one of their tweets. Who's more of a threat to your New Hampshire way of life? Carlos from Mexico, who happily works 12-hour days for $15 an hour laying concrete, mm-hmm. or Janet, the liberal arts major from Massachusetts, who doesn't believe in inflation, masks her child, and boasts her gun control? They were literally talking about we, if the cartel can come, if they like 
you know, free, uh, if they have good drugs, yeah, they enjoy uh, the right to bear arms. It was just hilarious. Isn't isn't masking your child though, your own child? That's a that would be pro pro libertarian stance, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, um, yeah. The libertarians are an interesting bunch. They're very good at trolling people. Very, very good. I, that also may have been Jeremy Coffin. I think might be a comedian. Okay. So we no, don't, we not. don't actually no, he's know not. if that's real or not. No, it is real. He's not a comedian. He's a build. Yeah. He's a future Senator from New Hampshire. Yeah. He's actually, he's going for it. He's going for it. Okay. <laughs> he wants Massachusetts to pay for it. Um, so are you going to move to Massachusetts and then try to sneak over the border? Um, to New Hampshire. Yeah. Well, there, do you think that, okay. So those people in that commercial, uh, huh. Do you think that they want Billy's? No, I'm, I went to a liberal arts school. They don't want me. You're indoctrinated. Yeah, I'm a big lib. Okay, to them. Uh, yeah, New Hampshire. Yeah, I went to a liberal arts school in Massachusetts. I, I'm exactly who they don't want. New Hampshire's New Hampshire's a very weird state, isn't it? Oh, it's great. It's like the most unique state, low key. I have cousins up there, and every Fourth of July, we go to their lake and we just blast off fireworks, and it is sick. And then we got. Uh, Never mind. What? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're not allowed to do fireworks anymore. <laughs> Wait, you aren't like a rule from your parents <laughs> or just like it's illegal? <laughs> no, no. We, we had an incident where uh, basically we turned a certain age where we started drinking and doing fireworks and then it got out of control. Okay. Again, I'm asking you, did... Did your parents tell you that you're not allowed to do fireworks? No, or is we, this a, we, we is were this like, a law that's been imposed? We were like, hey, we shouldn't do this anymore. Oh, you guys said it to yourselves. Yeah. You self-governed. We self-governed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it got too real for a well, second. Well, you know how they come those boxes? Yeah. Well, one one of the boxes, for some reason, we'd shoot it out, out on a raft. Uh -huh. We'd like float a raft out, then send them off the raft. And then we'd like p paddle away in a canoe. But then one time the box shot off one and then like a wave hit and it flipped on its side and yeah. then just started shooting fireworks at the shore and we had to like duck in the water and it was like holy shit this is like we're getting like blasted at and it was it was one of the most wild experiences and funniest things ever but like funny now that nothing bad happened but at the time we we're like holy shit we're gonna burn the house down but it was sick that does sound kind of sick <laughs> i've uh <laughs> I had a bad bottle rocket experience one time. I don't think you're really a kid unless you have a bad bottle rocket experience. We were just shooting them at each other in a field one time. You that's that's have, basically the bad experience. Do you ever experience. use the M80s? I, I have blown up. Um, what did I blow up? Like a watermelon, I think, one time with an M80. So M80s, ground exploding uh, fireworks, aren't legal in New Hampshire, but they're legal in Pennsylvania. And they're like literally quarter sticks of dynamite. Yeah. So one time I was camping in Pennsylvania and we were using the M80s to fish. Statue of Limitations, and I'm a minor, but we caught a huge, uh, it's illegal, but we were young and uh, we didn't really know what we were doing because we threw one in the lake, it exploded, and then a fish came up and we were dynamite fishing, basically. That sounds ethical. Not ethical. What does the game warden have to say about that? Didn't catch us. Uh, okay, well that, that's Billy on fireworks. That's Billy's blast off. That'll be a weekly have, segment. Have you guys ever done fireworks? I like how Billy refers to it like it's heroin. You guys ever? You guys <laughs> you ever, ever do fireworks? You ever done? I bet Aryans. <laughs> I, I bet Aryans done fireworks. You guys are lames. I mean, they weren't legal in Ohio to buy. You yeah. probably were too supervised as children. I was. I'm going to New Hampshire. I was extremely supervised. Billy, I, I, I didn't drink until college. You I think can, I was doing fireworks? I can wait. You didn't have. A, you didn't have your first drink until college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it like? A very, I think I had a couple sips of like a Long Island iced tea, and I was just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> um, you were totally a narc in high school. No, I what? Well, yeah, I wasn't a narc, but I would sit there and make sure everyone was okay. That's good. Yeah, I thought you're being a helpful friend. Yeah, I mean, I was terrified of alcohol. I thought I, my perception of alcohol was like you had a sip and you were drunk. I didn't realize there was like a scale to it. Yeah, there's a whole process. Yeah. behind it. Yeah. I, I know now. When did you have your first drink, Billy? Wait, let me guess. Mm. I bet Billy's dad let him try Guinness when he was nine. That was way too accurate. What is it? 
It's exactly that. Are you serious? Yeah, that's like yeah, that's really the, fucking that, weird, that's dude. The, that's really fucking weird. I, I read you like a fucking book on that, <laughs> that one. That is really weird. You seem like a... That was way too specific. Wait, was it actually nine? It was nine. Was it your dad? Yes. And Am was I, it Guinness? Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, fuck. Big T. I know this. That, I but know this you, one. but you, you know, you knew that was like a cultural thing. The age was the right. <laughs> the age was the right. Well, I didn't know. I just know you pretty well. The I may have mentioned nine before. No, yeah, you, you, I don't think you've ever told me that. But that's a cultural thing. It is a cultural thing. It's amongst like milk the, amongst it, the footballs. It makes you strong. <laughs> All right, Big T, you had your first drink. Uh, wait, wait. What, it depends what you mean. On purpose, I was like twenty three. Was uh. I was doing a thing where I was going to guess it exactly. Oh, okay. Well, that was by my own volition. Uh, one time I was like 18. It was probably like the summer between my senior year of high school and freshman year of college. I was at a movie with my friends and they had brought in tequila because they're degenerates. And uh, they bought like a high C to mix the tequila in. And they were like, drink some of this because we don't want it full but they had already put the tequila in it. Got it. Um, it wasn't that terrible. Uh, but then, yeah, then I didn't actually drink till I was like 23. Okay. I, I was not going to get that one. What made you decide to drink? Um, I was going on dates when I lived in New York, and I was just sick of, like, girls wanting to go to bars and me being like, I don't drink. It was just annoying. Yeah. I, I could understand how that would be a, a challenge. So I, yeah. So I still don't drink, like, very often maybe like once every couple months but if you're trying to meet somebody and i think most people in their 20s when they think of a first date they like to have a couple drinks yeah get a little looser so it was just meet a, up with people it was a convenience thing more than anything else yeah that makes sense um avery you were 15 and your dad let you have a beer at Thanksgiving. Nope. Fuck. What is it? You don't know. I don't know. Because no. you blacked out. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> when was yours, PFT? Mine was... Actually, mine's not that much different from Billy's. My mom let me have a beer when I was... Uh... No... It was actually not my mom. I had my first beer was a Corona when I was 13 at my friend's house and uh, his sister bought them for us. Corona Extra. It was sick. <laughs> it was a great time. I honestly don't even remember. I got a, I, there's definitely a picture of it for sure. You, wait, you took a picture of your first your first like drink? someone took a picture of me having it. I have a I have a I know, whole camera. I know for sure. Like photo shoot the first night I drank. Mad dog. That's so crazy. I took a mirror pick with a Bud Light. I but, was on but fire. December 2nd, to, 2015. To def defend, so I had that beer when I was nine, but probably the next time I had a dr like an actual, like the first time I got drunk was like, like probably like 13. Okay. Like, like not just like a, oh, you can have a beer on the holiday. Like the first time I was like, got after it. First time you got after it was when you were thirteen. Got it. Okay. Um, what's okay? Let's let's do a different convo, somewhat similarly <laughs> related. What's the what's the jankiest combo of alcohol and mixer you've ever had? Like Big T was talking about tequila and high C. Oh. That's pretty janky, I'd say. But we've all done some janky stuff in our day. I did um, freshman year of college. My favorite mixer was Dr Pepper and Kamchata. What's Kamchata? Shitty, shitty alcohol, like shitty vodka. Kamchata? Kamchatka? It's like this the the city in Stranger Things that he's banished to. Are you I, It's not Rumchata? No, Shitty K, we called it. F five okay. Five Loco. It was a shot of Everclear and five hour energy. That is insane. It it literally it's it was the person who introduced us to it, uh like died. No, I did one. I was like, I'm not taking another one. Like that is gonna kill you. I'm yes. just gonna go back to drinking beer. So then, but then one guy I was with took like five and just blacked out. And we had to we just wheeled him around in a wheelchair uh, because we at the place we were at, 
it was like a like a motel and they had wheelchairs in the back so we just like were wheelchairing this guy around yeah you take five shots of that you should call the police on yourself yeah that night is not going to end well it's a be, terrible idea. Nobody out there try that. I'll be honest. Like, we did it a ton in college. But it, thinking back, it's so disgusting. Like, Smirnoff and Gatorade. That's yeah. No, horrible. that was... No, that's a... That's, that's the go-to, though. But it's, you, it's disgusting. But, that that but, was honestly going to be mine, too. Yeah. We used, to, we used to do that a lot because it's like you get rid of the hangover before you get it. Right. And it was so distinguishable, yeah. too. Like, nobody really... You're just drinking Gatorade. But yeah. it was so gross. The problem with that is... Every time you have a Gatorade from that point on, you're going to think that you taste the vodka in the background. Yeah. It's going to remind you of that vodka. It's going to be bad. Mine is, well, mine was going to be that one, but also uh, Mountain Dew and tequila. I like to make a little. I loved doing that. Yeah, it's actually, it's the Trailer Park Margarita. Yeah. And I, I made this over at uh, at Fights when he did Friendsgiving a couple years ago in 2020. Went over there. Um, Casey was over there. A few other people were over there. And we were... Um, Nate, I think, stopped by and ended up just Irish goodbying everybody and left his girlfriend there. That was nice. Uh, we we brought over tequila and preferably nice tequila, Mountain Dew, and then you get the Cool Ranch Doritos that you crumble up into a little dust and you use that as the rim around the glass. It was fantastic. Uh, I didn't have a teed off, but you have just inadvertently, le- inadvertently led me to one. Let's go. The term Friendsgiving. Oh, okay, yeah. It I know. makes me I know. When want I said to it, die. Yep. Th- the term Thanksgiving already encompasses, y- you can give thanks for your friends. Yep. It, it, no. it, there is no need to change that word. No, but Big T, like, it's for your when you, you come back from college and see your friends for the first time in a long time. I was using it's a dumb it. word. I was using it's, it uh, in, in terms of... I know. I'm not mad at you. It was... I it, hate the word. It was the pandemic, and so I couldn't go visit my parents who are a little bit older, so I didn't want to get them sick just in case I was asymptomatic. So we stayed in New York City, and it was a bunch of people that didn't go to visit their parents because of the pandemic. Again, yeah, I, I'm not mad at you for going. I, no, I'm mad that I, just I called the it word. Friendsgiving. I'm getting very defensive because I know that's a shitty term. And I apologize for that. No need to apologize. I defend Frank Friendsgiving. I love It's actually a very, like... Big T, have you ever gone to a Friendsgiving? Uh no. Hmm. Hmm. We could have a friends giving. No. <laughs> we can have a a, a dose giving. Mm-hmm. There there does need to be more of a like we should eat Thanksgiving food besides just on Thanksgiving. I'm gonna be out of the country on Thanksgiving. You think they do it big in Qatar? <laughs> I doubt <laughs> it. No. You probably can get <laughs> killed for celebrating. <laughs> it's gonna be a fun time. Me, um, it's gonna be me and Donnie doing doing thanksgiving Dude. together over in the middle east how long are y'all there uh i'm gonna so it's tricky because oh of time God, zones you just reminded me what? i had a dream okay we're gonna we're gonna okay. get to billy's dream in a second <laughs> <laughs> uh but big t to answer your question i think i'm leaving on like a tuesday afternoon and because of time zones i'm not getting there until like wednesday afternoon and then Jeez. i'm flying back on saturday morning and i'm landing on like saturday afternoon here oh so you're only there for a couple days yeah just there for a couple days are you there for a usa game yeah it's gonna be usa versus england oh that's sick yeah gonna stick it right in the queen's never mind (laughs) never mind (laughs) it's you shouldn't she just died she just nobody watched the funeral did you see that Oh really? Yeah. No ratings? Uh, I think it was because tw- she was woke. It was twenty-eight million, which was <laughs> no, less it was than four. The- <laughs> no, it was four billion. Uh, no, no, no. That was the estimate worldwide. It didn't get that high in England. The estimates were, I forget, in the thirties or something. But only twenty-eight million people in England watched it, which was less than the Euro twenty twenty final. Rip, Damn. No, rip, but- bozo. <laughs> <laughs> So the Lizzie, the Lizzie in the box. Set, that's, why, that's why her name is L. Elizabeth. You know, facts. You know why? So I figured out which chant that they were mimicking. We are fucked. We are fucked. We are really fucked. When they're like losing. Okay. That's the chant that they're mimicking. Lizzie in a box. In a box. In in a box. box. Lizzie in, in a box. box. It's, it's a, such a funny chant, dude. I was in a. I saw some Irish guys chanting it in a bathroom of a, a bar last weekend, and it's just so catchy. Yeah. It is. I, it's it's not funny, but it is. Like when they do like a moment of silence, and then just one guy's like, "Lizzie's in a box." 
<laughs> they, there was another one where they did uh they asked for a round of applause <laughs> for the queen and then the, the fans started to chant like clap your hands if you're glad Lizzie's yeah, dead yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i saw that if you're happy Lizzie's He's dead, dead clap, clap your hands yeah <laughs> And meanwhile, the, but, all the players on the field were already giving like a round yeah. of applause. David Beckham showed out, though, for the Queen. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I don't think there's a thing in this world I'd stand in line for 13 hours to do. Not one. Hmm. Hmm. Tennessee National Championship game. <laughs> I Like, like I to go into the game, the line 13, is 13 hours. 13 hours, yeah. They're, now they're porta potties, but you don't know if they're going to. I don't win. think so, man. I, I'll watch Two, for them to win. No, but see, that's not a thing. Yeah, I know it's not. It's possible. not like if you wait in line for thirteen hours, you get ten billion dollars. It's to to something is happening. Yeah, and you have to wait thirteen hours to go to it. What if I don't it's think like there's a thing? What if it's like you're going to die and you have to and you have to wait thirteen hours in line for like the cure? Uh, again, that's, that's not. not Diff- what we're no, talking but let's about. say that let's say they release a new COVID that just like is ensures you die and they are that's like coming. Like, so like, you know, they're cutting down, but the only people who can live are the ones who get the Microsoft X Pfizer collab vaccine. Okay, then obviously, yeah. Big T, would you wait in line if there was a disease that was as contagious as COVID, except it killed 50% of the people out there that got it and they had a vaccine? Would you wait in line for 13 hours for the vaccine? Probably not. (laughs) <laughs> no, just say, just take your chances. You, no. ra- you round up fifty percent to the nearest hole. That's a hundred percent survival rate, brother. I, and if it was fifty percent, <laughs> I'd take a vaccine. I would get the vaccine if you could get it to me and not have to wait in line for thirty. That hours. is five hundred times more deadly than what COVID was recorded. Mm-hmm. How many people died of COVID? I think it was like a million. Still a lot of people. Well, it depends if you're trusting the official numbers or not. I'm trusting Big T's numbers. I know you did account. You did a pretty thorough <laughs> analysis. Uh, I so definitely. Believe, how many were on your spreadsheet? I definitely believe I, a million no people idea. died with COVID. <laughs> yeah. And compared to how many people die in America a day. Well, if you look at I, so I did do a little bit of research on that uh, uh, about a week ago and saw that. A week ago. What do you mean? I was just Bobby Schmurter song. Oh, okay. Uh, I saw that the uh, life expectancy in America took a pretty big dip over the last couple of years yeah overdoses and over yeah. during the lockdown yeah but they they have the Suicides. exact amount they have the exact amount of overdoses that they can put in there and let but you those know. i'd like to those see count. what you yeah, do count the i'd like to see what you're looking at because okay. everyone that died of covid was in their 80s there there was a couple younger people yeah one or two I know, enough, not enough to affect the U.S. life expectancy. oh yeah for no, sure no 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 you know, you know how many people died like there are excess deaths over normal in the last two years have been way higher. Okay, send, that, me, that, send me this. That's probably like, the best metric because I do agree that there you can't get a, a straight number from a lot of mainstream no, but, sources. I agree with that because it, it's starting at, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was no, um, they weren't separating with and because of at all. And there are also, some, but I, I understand why, because sometimes you can have COVID and that can cause something else in your body to go but wrong. Think, but think about And then this. you die of that. So I understand why they didn't necessarily always separate it. But there definitely were some cases where it was like, okay, this person died of a completely unrelated thing but had COVID. So that number gets tossed in too. And that's kind of bullshit. But the way, the speed that, at which things were happening, it was tough to be able to sort all those out in real time. So think about this, PFT. So let's say you have an Uber score, right? And you always are polite to the Uber driver. And you get mm-hmm. five stars, five stars. Yeah. And then... One time you're getting an Uber when you're drunk on the way back from the bar, a sloppy night, and you puke in the Uber, and then you get zero stars. Your five-star rating is going to go down. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter how many rides you have, it's going to go down exponentially. So if you have a bunch of, you know, life expectancies, what is it, 72 in the U.S.? 78. 78. 79. A bunch, like 78, 78, and then you have a bunch of 20-year-olds, teenagers, and 30-year-olds die of suicide, opioids, effects of the lockdown that's going to set it down way more than a bunch of people dying at 75 80 60 so i mean statistically those younger deaths are going to impact the at the average life expectancy way more than all the deaths from up above like all the older deaths but not if there's a shitload of deaths of people in their 60s which there were 
Right, but that's gonna that's gonna bring it down. But statistic, but yeah, but the combo. Yeah, of course that there's like, do you have the numbers of how many people in their twenties committed suicide and in twenty twenty, and overdose deaths? Because it's, it, it probably I know it was a lot, and I don't want to minimize those. It was those. more. It was more than normal. And yeah. so in the opioids were, I wrote tons of papers on the opioid crisis in college and we were on a decrease until my junior spring when we all got locked down and then they bumped up to 2016 levels, which was like the height. Yeah. So let's see in 2020 and 2021, 14.9 million excess deaths. It's a lot. Anyway, you know what? We should wait, to, wait, wait, wait. What? Uh, it's a lot. Explain to me what excess deaths means. Okay. Because uh, a million people in the U.S. died of COVID. Right. Total. Right. So what does that mean? Excess deaths. So this is this is worldwide. Okay. Do just U.S. I'm trying to find that. You right know what? Now. Joe Biden said the pandemic's over, so it's over. Let's just start moving on. It'll be over when it's politically expedient for well, it to be over. Well, he just said it's over. If Biden says it's over, the libs can't keep keep going with it. Is that in the same interview? He said it was uh, good that we had 8.5% inflation. Yeah. So He uh, needed something to deflect. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Oh, can I tell you about my dream? Yes. So I had a dream that uh, we got invaded by the Russians, Black Dawn, uh, Red Dawn style. Mm -hmm. And uh, like we had to like get inspiration from like the uh, Afghan Taliban to like try to fight them back. So we were like, how, like, how do we like, they beat the American, like they drove out the Americans. How do we beat, drive out the Russians? We got to use the same principles. And then I had this, like, then this one dude came up. Cause you know how we're talking about, uh, make your own stories, QAnon. So this one dude hijacked all the QAnoners. It was like, yo, if you like do suicide bombings, you're going to get your own playboy mansion in heaven with, uh, JFK Jr. And that was like the way we made extremist QAnoners suicide bombers to beat the Russians. Wow. So you're going to get 72 Playboy buddies in your own Playboy mansion in heaven. And it worked. Incredible. Yeah. But it was really sad. Incredible. But like that's a way you could make a radical QAnon group. Um, I've got a quick question for you guys. A little trivia question here. Anybody care to take an estimate as to how many ants there are on Earth. Oh, I know the biomass is more than humans. Yeah, I you're right. Like, I think if all the humans in the world were just like blended up and put in a, a cube, you could fit that cube over Central Park. I think there's a yes, graphic I've, of I've that. That's, that. Yeah, but I think the that one of fact. ants... It would be a hilarious cube. Yeah, I think the one of... <laughs> wait, wait, what color would it be? Uh, pink slime. Pink It'd be pink? Real, pink slime. I think it might... Maybe slime. a little more like... Gray? Like no no pink slime bro think about all the blood blood yeah, everything's red I yeah, think but it would be darker more towards brown there's a lot of stuff that we have inside our body that's not red though no but like but everything's a lot of blood. red no no you're just thinking about the blood the, you think you're, the, the like stuff in, that's red in our body is only red because of the blood right so what happens when we blend it all up so there's a lot of parts that don't have blood in it but it's still but it's all blended up with blood still so it would like the, all the blood is still there I think it'd be great you know pink. that the spleen it would be pink slime that's what I'm saying. It wouldn't be blood red. It would be pink slime. Like okay, I want to guess how many ants. It's got to be <laughs> know, an absurd I know, number. I, know I, think, the I think the ants is like a cube the size of New York State as opposed to the to the cube over Central Park. I don't know. Like I don't know in cube form. <laughs> I know. So I if know there's the eight, answer is. so if there's eight billion people and the mass of the ants is that much larger than humans, then you have to take that. How many ants would make up a human? I don't know the answer to that well, one. There's definitely more ants, but, but ants, the biomass. Ha ants have had a huge come up recently because they just they did a, a study. The National Academy of Sciences published a brand new study about this, and it surprised them. So the person that wrote the study um, said that this was much much larger than they had previously estimated. The previous okay, I, estimation. I want to guess. I want to guess. Answer back. Answer back, big time. Uh. My official guess is that there are 17 trillion ants. I think it's way higher than that. I think it's like in the quadrillions. I think it's probably like seven to 10 quadrillion. So the previous estimate was between one quadrillion and 10 quadrillion. Oh, okay, I way undershot it. I thought that sounded too, like too much though. We got 20 
quadrillion ants Whoa. on Earth. So that's that's twenty thousand trillions. Actually, that's not true in one continent. Jeez. What do you mean? What? There's not more ants than humans on one continent. Alaska, right. Antarctica. Antarctica. Yeah. yeah. There's no ants in Antarctica. The only continent without ants. <laughs> there might be, might be a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that there's a fucking ant farm. One of those nerds brought an ant farm down there. And I, all it takes is one. I know. All fuck. it takes is one. If there's, they bring, definitely, there's one ant farm. If they bring one ant farm down it's there, then ants. It's way too goddamn cold. One freaking, one freaking draft is going to kill all the ants. Yeah. You know they're all bundled up in there? Do you know how many crimes have been committed? We already we had an episode on this, right? Well, About we all the to- crimes that were committed in Antarctica that we just don't that no one really followed up on because it was just like, yo, dude, they're locked. They're can't prove anything. Yeah, snow blind. Can't prove it. Won't get a jury. Can't have a jury of your peers <laughs> if you can't. If what is it? If the gl- <laughs> there was one um there was one place in North America. I want to say it was in Wyoming or Idaho. It was known as the death zone. Oh yeah, because. There was no jurisdiction in which to find a jury of your peers. So if you had if yeah. you had killed somebody on that property, you could never be held liable for it. We were talking about that in the Lapaglia case. Uh, remember we the guy who killed? Yeah, yeah. Brianna Chicken Fry. No, yeah. no. <laughs> Who's the girl? The, 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 the <laughs> thing the girl is, got if, killed? if Brianna Chicken Fry strangles one of her simps to death after they request her to choke them out, um, uh, you can't be prosecuted yeah. for it. Right? No. Who is the girl? Is Gabby that- Petito. Oh yeah, yeah. And Brian La- Laundry. Laundry. So yeah, I, I I mixed up a last name that was Italian with a. <laughs> no, so it's very racist of you, Billy. I know. Uh, no, but we were talking like, do we think we were talking about how we thought Brian? That was before we, they found her. Might have taken her there, but that loophole was closed because a guy killed an elk in that area just to like illegally to fit to close a loophole he thought he was doing yeah. a service to the supreme court yeah <laughs> imagine anytime somebody has a big idea of how to like upend the judicial system they're always going to end up going to jail that's that's kind of how things go yeah it's like no your honor that flag doesn't have the yellow tassels on it this is a farce of a court you need to try me in a maritime in a maritime setting i actually i love those um the sovereign citizen people we should do an episode about them have you heard about them billy you you're kind of low-key sovereign citizen yeah where like people argue sovereign citizen law to get out of things like speeding tickets and shit yeah and sometimes they're just so annoying that the judges let them off they're like i don't want to deal with you anymore yeah. um those guys used to call in so when i used to listen to the alex jones show at my lunch break on my way into work on that very same station in austin uh, there would be like almost regional versions of Alex Jones. And um, there was one in particular that's hosted by a lady. I forget her name. And most of the callers were just people calling in with tips on how to argue speeding tickets in court by going back to like the U.S. Penal Code of 19 or <laughs> like 1791. Yeah. And it was the most ridiculous people, but they call in and give their stats. Like how many how many traffic tickets have you gotten out of those people? They are hilarious. I love them. I love them so much. We should have. We should have one of them on the show, actually. Isn't there a country in the desert? Uh, I remember watching a, like a Vice documentary, and some guy was riding a like a like a a drivable cooler. It was like a sort of a homeless community, and they considered themselves their own nation, and just no one really cared because they're basically a homeless community. Because, like, by that definition, like half of California is in America. I did not. No, I haven't seen that. Like the tent cities. Okay. It was low-key a tent city, and they're just like, this is a country now. I've not seen that. I might try to establish a, a sovereign state in the middle of Hoboken with my uh, prime minister, Mincy. I think you guys could do that. Um, yeah. They did that in some apartment complex on the Lower East Side down in Alphabet City. Oh, yeah. I forget the name of, of those buildings, but it was like a bunch of um, some people that were homeless at the time, some other people that were like really active in the uh, New York punk scene of like the 70s and 80s I think and they were going to bulldoze the apartment complexes and put up new condos so they were evicting everybody and these people just they boarded themselves in and they just like fought off the sheriffs and the police officers that would come by to try to evict them forcibly until the city just kind of gave up and let them stay there pretty cool yeah huh what uh 
So, Big T, anything else to teed off about? No, that's about it. Just Friendsgiving? Yeah. Not a lot to be upset about this week. It's I'm too nervous to be upset. It's Tennessee week, baby. Yeah, yeah. We, we went on a huge tangent. I love how the brains are firing this morning. Yeah, I mean, brain, this, this afternoon, actually. Brains are brains are going off right now. We're buzzing. Boys are buzzing because there's a full moon. Yo, are the planets good again? Uh, I don't know. All I know, I Aries men no longer are on my side. Well, of course, they're the men who would respond to get really mad about it, right? Yeah, my yep. brother in Christ, take a look in the mirror. I mean, yeah, see? You did a... um. Yeah, it was actually a, a perfect example of explaining how astrology works. Just by putting that out there to one specific group of people. And then everyone, now all of a sudden, you think that we only have Aries followers and listeners of the podcast. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know that much about it, like comparatively to like a lot of people. And they were like, I can't believe that you would say all this stuff. I, babe, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a statistical breakdown, though, of NFL quarterbacks by astrology sign. Well, actually, remember, it's a lot of Capricorns. Have you, uh, the, what's the book where they talk about the outliers? Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, right? Yeah, and he talks about how a lot of professional athletes are born in January because of the age cutoffs. I yeah. can, I can and, do a, uh, can, can you do that? For hockey, yeah. for winter sports. I would like to see current NFL quarterbacks just ba I want to do this season alone. I want to know what's going because the planets are never the same. So I want to know this season alone which sign uh, has statistically the, better quarterbacks. Okay. Just so like the 32 starting quarterbacks of the NFL right now. I yeah. would actually okay. summer summer birthdays because most private like the Catholic schools, the private schools that a lot of them compete in, like the powerhouses mm -hmm. have those they cut have offs. they have the summer cutoffs. Mm -hmm. Like Tom Brady for example is oh his birthday's always in training camp mm -hmm. wasn't isn't Joe Burrows also I'm going to be so real with you. I, I forget when to. Joe's is. I think it's I, I think it's going to be summer. What's calendar. the one after Leo? Virgo. Virgo, yeah. I think it's a lot of Virgos. I have way too many Leos in my life, so I'm I'm battling a lot of Leo energy all the time. Yeah. Oh. The uh Commanders battled yeah. some a lot of Leos and lost last week. Yeah. <laughs> that was tough. You know like how sometimes the New York Post has some crazy articles that like create crazy stories. They not sometimes, all the time. They love to get me to quote tweet their fucking headlines. Hundred percent. That's that's their entire yeah. mission. It's like what can we what obvious joke can we put in a headline to make all of America quote tweet us? Right. So there was a big one today. It was Sporn Sexual Polygamist with Eight Wives Reveals Their Strict Demands. This is great. What's a sporn sexual? I don't know. Uh, but this guy, this Brazilian polygamist opened up about his busy married life. And he said that, let me find this here. He said that they demand I be in shape, otherwise I get lectured. I don't eat gluten, lactose, or even breads and pasta. It, it goes, I mean, this is, this is insane. So he has eight wives, but he just, they, they, they demand him to do crazy things. Why would you want eight wives? I don't know. That would suck. Um, he has a sex roster to make sure all his wives are satisfied. Okay, I like that. Yeah, he's got a sex roster. I yeah. mean, every you gotta you gotta have a seven days a week. Yeah, you really have to be good with. I thought with, about like the planning out and logistics. If you're having sex with eight different people, yeah, so, but what happens like? So a sporn sexual is a type of man that is very focused on his appearance his body care to be hairless in all of the body except the head no eyebrows oh that's the, the head. head is that kind of like metrosexual no. that was a real big thing back in metrosexual the late 90s is just more of a, f a feminine straight guy are we still doing metrosexuals no no i think i think that just became the regular the norm the no that's what Oh, now God. all the soy boys are yeah 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 now we no one in america grows a beard and chops wood anymore his dream is to have children with all of his wives. He said, I only have one daughter, but I want to have a child with each one of my wives. And my dream is to have 10 wives. So he's two away. Why would you include his daughter in that phrase? It's kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, it's weird. No, he only has one daughter. Yeah. So he wants more kids. No, but I, I agree. The way that that was said made it seem. Yeah. Like he's going to marry his daughter. A yeah. It seemed like he was going to marry his yeah. daughter on that one. What was... Uh, speaking of New York Post headlines, before we get into more talk about Enron, um, I wanted to bring this up. The, the Space Force has a new anthem. Mm -hmm. Did you guys hear about that? Mm 
Yeah, I did. I'm not sure if it will get a copyright strike for it, but we could play it. We'll give it. We'll give it a go. That's actually that's a good point. Are we gonna get? I don't want to get this this video demonetized. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Libertarian Party <laughs> that won't get us demonetized? No. Okay, I'm not gonna play the song then. But, but go, go listen to go it. Go listen to yeah. the, the Space Force anthem on your own. Um, Space Force is still a very just a funny thing to say. Space Force. Where they come up with that name? Do you think? Trump's Trump. tweet. Yeah. <laughs> what do they even do? Do we even know what they're doing? So, oh, actually, it is kind of it does kind of rock that oh, you can shit. get an entire brand new branch of the military named just because you Yo, tweeted it out. I totally forgot. I think he's the only one that could do that. <laughs> yeah, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, yeah, check this out. I Imagine got, if Biden did that. <laughs> I have a Space Force pa- a Space Force patch that I got from a Space Force engineer in Colorado. That's cool. I forgot about that. That's so it cool. is real. Oh yeah, of course it's real. So the Space Force it's like it was people that were already serving in the armed forces and they just kind of redesignated some of them. I, I have nothing but respect for the good men and women of the United States Space Force. Is this stolen valor? <laughs> you wearing their patch? Yeah. Do you have your coin? Do you have your challenge coin on have, you too? You know how many challenge coins I have? <laughs> Guess. Four. Two. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this this headline from The Guardian is unbelievable. U.S. military. It's not a banger. Response to the Space Force's official song is less than stellar. It's not a banger. Who Who wrote it? Um, Martin Pengley. See, you gotta have you gotta have Imagine Dragons write your fucking Space Force anthem. Yeah, that's it's a it's a one band horse race on that one. Can you imagine that? Like, just make it sound like a college football commercial. <laughs> Space Force. Imagine, dude, just use the music for Radioactive, mm-hmm. and that makes me want to enlist immediately. I'm the Space Force. The new song. I'm the yeah. Space Force. Oh, the, the new song Semper Supra is set to a jaunty tune but critics say its lyrics are verbal word salad can we can okay. we hear it i or i didn't hear it yet. or just do the the was it zombie nation song oh 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 it's the space wars in the universe i'm telling you like they should hire me to make these decisions for them all right i'll play there's one thing i was born to do it's to is to put electronic sing-along songs and assign them with various branches of the military. Okay, I'll play it, but nobody talk during it, and then um, so if it gets it. copyright straight, I can just cut okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like that second chord. Maybe fifth. There we go. Back to first. One, one. <laughs> Three. Four. Okay, so you know what that reminded me of? That's a banger. I'm not no, it, it low key it low key reminded me of uh, a song from Far Cry five. Keep your rifle by your side. Yeah, it's like they tried to design a, a World War One song. Yeah. And make it about the Space Force. He- it leans way too heavily on the flutes. Yeah. I don't hate it though. I don't mind I don't mind the like lumbering tuba part and the trombone and all that stuff. But the flutes, the the high pitched like tinkly noises. It doesn't make me want to go to space, I'll tell you that much. They need who who was the genius that made a song about the Space Force and didn't include any laser sound It was effects? Yeah, yeah. We should have David Bowie actually yes. should have made the Space Force anthem. You need some Ground fucking... control, you need Space some, Force. You need one. some fucking... Some laser beam sound effects in that one. I'll write a much better Space Force song than that. That's that's for damn sure. Um, so Big T again, not teed off about anything at all this week because he's, he's too nervous about Tennessee football. And that's a reminder to everybody out there that if you're in Knoxville or you're close by to Knoxville, come see us. We're going to be hanging out. Where are we going to be tailgating? Tell the people where to come meet us. If, if you're in Knoxville, Tennessee, and you want to come say what's up, where should they go, Big T? Yeah, so Saturday morning, uh, like 10 to 12-ish, uh, we're going to be at Spires Tailgate. It's in G5 parking lot, which is... Uh, right next to the stadium. Everybody will know where that is. So that's where we'll be hanging out Saturday morning. And then we'll go to the college football show. Love it. 
love it. Come talk to us. And if you're looking for someone else to talk to out there, I would suggest BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a great sponsor of this show. They actually provide a, a wonderful service to people. That's that's online therapy. It's cheaper. It's more accessible. So if you have an issue where you feel self-conscious about going to see a therapist, maybe you don't like cameras, you can use BetterHelp or you can talk to somebody online and you can do the face-to-face webcam experience as well. Um, but with BetterHelp, they're a great tool to use for online therapy. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode sometimes when you face a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. And a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier for you to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or how small. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option because it's convenient, it's accessible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Dose today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Dose, BetterHelp.com slash Dose to get 10% off your first month. BFT, I'll tell you exactly where we're going to be. We'll be at the Hill Bar and Grill on 1105 Forest Ave, Knoxville, Tennessee from... I think the show, the show starts at 1.30. So we're going to be hosting the wing competition. There's going to be a wing competition. I don't know who's competing in it exactly yet, but we will be there. The whole crew will be there. Stop by. It's free to enter. So it's going to be a great time. Oh, I love that wing competition. Yes, the Hooters wing competition. Let's go. Come. Are you eating? I don't know if I'm going to eat or not. My understanding is it's going to be a Tennessee fan and a Florida fan okay. with like me and Josh Prey behind them, like rooting them on okay. is my understanding. Which team are you going to root for? That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard Billy might be eating some wings. That's what I heard, too. Yeah. I need some prep time. So we're going to get into town on Friday, right? Yeah. Getting in there early on Friday. Mm-hmm. Too early, in my opinion. Very. You uh, guys are earlier than Big T and I. Very early. I, so it's going to be me, Avery, Billy. On a flight. Getting in uh, super early. It's a 6 a.m. flight. We have a, we have a connector. Wait, Why did y'all all get on that one? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they didn't have your chilling. The options were very slim. So it's a 6 a.m. flight. We have a connecting flight and we get to Knoxville around 10. Wait, wait, wait. So I, y'all chose a 6 a.m. flight that connects? I don't know. I, I, I low key. It's not like we chose it. It's not like I was like, yes, please give me the yeah, 6 a.m. Yes, flight. Yes, you did. They asked. There's but not there, a lot of there were, It was slim is what wait, I was saying. Was that or a 930 direct flight? Yeah, but I also didn't. When I asked what airports everyone How wanted to go to, how far is it driving? I preferred not to go to New probably t- thirteen hours. The answer is no, Billy. You're getting on the plane. Me, 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 me. me and Big T are gonna <laughs> hang out. Are you excited about that, Big T? I'm sitting next to Jack McCarthy on the plane too. Oh, did you get? Did he you just said he just yeah, said he no. Just said we're no. not hanging. No, out. What, well, I'll see you at the gate, <laughs> and I'm in Comfort Plus. <laughs> Wait, Whoa, you're in Comfort you, Plus? How do you get Comfort Plus? I upgraded. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I have Sky Miles, baby. 11 hours, not that bad. <laughs> All right, so wait, wait, wait. If anyone's on the 930 we flight to Knoxville, we're, we're getting come in hang there. out with me. We're getting, yeah, come hang out. If any Mad Dog simps out there, provided yeah. you're not an Aries, hang out. Yeah, I'm um, bored. We're going to get in early on Friday, so I... I think we should plan out what we should do. We should work out. And not, fuck, no, no. We, we are really going. Go. What? what? There will be an opportunity to do that. Yeah, later on in the day. Uh, are we going to go out Friday night? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you bet your ass we are. We hit Market Absolutely. Square? I don't know. It's Market Square. Uh, it's it's the cool part of downtown. Okay. I love waking up super early because it just gives me a total excuse to consume like crazy amounts of stimulants. Yeah, we can tell. <laughs> so we're not going to work out right when we get there. There will be a workout element that we're doing later on in the day. What are we doing? Just relax, Billy. Jeez, that's tell me. And uh, we did tell you, <laughs> but but we will need to figure out something to do during the day. Yeah. Recommendations. I mean, what are we trying to do? I don't know. Just give me something fun to do in Knoxville. Go see the big sun globe, sun we, sphere. We could go to the sun sphere. The wor- I don't even know. Side I've of never the like. Fair. I've never. Be- can you go inside it? I think you can. I don't know. We need vlogging. Material, I've never done it. So I saw this one video of a frat at Tennessee playing Rocky Top and dancing outside on their lawn for like two hours straight, and I kind of want to do that. Just dance outside of a frat for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Rocky Top. Oh, I just go yeah. Wasn't, wasn't I the one who suggested going to a frat and everyone shot that down? No, no, no. no. We're not going to a frat. I'm not going to a frat party. 
Bit I will I will run into the party. Let's extract you know, all the information we need and run back out and tell you guys what happened. Let's just go to a class. Let's just go sit down oh, in a class. I, I like swore that to my life I'd never go back to school. No. Bro, let's just go. Like let's that. go find I know where all the big like lecture halls are. Yeah. Let's, let's just go class. sit in one. I love that. I'm not going back. Okay. And someone will like for sure recognize you so we can only be in there for a minute. No, I'll, I'll I'm do, not going back. Okay, Billy, you're you're out of this conversation right now. We know you're not going. Um I think I think I can do. I, I'll go like in disguise. Yeah, I'll, I can. Do you think it would be better? I think it'd be better if we just go sit down in one totally unannounced. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't say anything about it at all. I'm I'm gonna bring my backpack with me. So if you're what are the kids wearing these days, if you're at UT and you have a Friday afternoon Nike class shorts, that you don't go want as a to girl. attend, I'll go as a sorority girl with like a big oversized I T-shirt. Can bring you, I can bring you my sorority stuff you with have, my letters on it. Do you have Nike shorts? Like, I do have Nike, shorts. Nike this shorts. This would rock. You we, have to no, we shave buy your legs. The, we should buy like the checkerboard waders. Like the- That's no, not that, gonna get him in class. You're gonna just stand out. I actually just realized if I wear the shorts, then yeah, my legs, oh, yeah, what, I definitely don't have well, what, what's legs. The, I can bring you leggings. But I think this I think this could be really funny yeah. actually. Let's just go audit a class. I'm what, trying to think what- What type of classes do they have in those big rooms? So. Probably there's psychology. There's AMB, which is right next to Neyland. Uh, what class did I have in a big one in there? Uh, was it? Uh, I had econ in a in a big lecture hall in there. Um, most of my class were in the journalism building, which is all really small rooms. They might recognize us in there. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, but no, yeah, we can either go to AMB or um, what's the other one? Okay, don't say it out loud because. It We'll have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. want people to blow the spot. Yeah, cut if that. You, if you go to the University of Tennessee, be cool. <laughs> if you have a class that you don't usually attend on Friday afternoons, maybe go. You oh might, yeah, Friday morning class might show up. Yeah, y'all got to wait for us to get there though. We get there like two hours after you. Fuck. Okay. What time do you get in? Noon. Twelve. Well, we'll use right. the time. We can be there by two. We'll use the okay. time by the time you get there to like get stuff to disguise him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know if it's you like want the, girl clothes. It's like the Eli Manning video of him yeah. going back to Penn State. That oh, was yeah. so good. So actually, low key, he didn't look that good throwing the ball. Okay. Okay. No, but like if you watch the video. For like a 40-year-old? Right, right. But like that's the funny thing. Like him throwing the ball, there's like – he. I don't think he threw a single like actual spiral. Yeah, he did. I saw the video. But like – He wasn't fast. He was, I mean, it wasn't like – it wasn't like the uh, like the golf video. I mean, he's older, he's retired, but it wasn't like the golf video where it was just like this guy's sick. Like he didn't stand out that much. Yeah. I I didn't think he looked that different from like if he if that dude walked into this room, I'd be like, that's Eli Manning. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like that's Eli Manning dressed as Matthew McConaughey. I felt bad for the other quarterback because he was like, oh man, this is my this is my chance walk on. Did they just fucking make a foolery out of it? Yeah. At the Jared Goff one, when he did that, didn't he have like a couple bad passes? <laughs> That'd be so funny if somebody like got dressed up and did that thing where they're like trying out for a college team. They go there, they absolutely suck. And they're like, no, sorry, dude. You're oh, cut. no, he started out bad on purpose. Oh, on purpose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. That's going to be the, the thing. Like PFT goes back to school. I like that. Not sure if I'm going to be dressed as a woman. It's been a while since I've dressed as a woman. <laughs> if there's anything else you think we should do, just tweet at us. Tweet at the page. Tweet been at any of us. Like two and a half years. Should I try to pretend I'm like a, a punter? Like what? What do you mean? We're not oh, talking. Football we're team. not talking about like going to football practice. We're talking about just going into a classroom. Okay. Yeah. I'm. I'm looking uh, right now. I'm trying to find what time classes start. If there's an interesting class, I'd actually like to go to it. I mean, there are interesting classes. Yeah, there's like a cool, like, like the new Lana Del Rey NYU class. <laughs> Fucking would take that in a second. What class is that? Well, Lana Del Rey's got a new class. Are um, you a Lana stan? Oh, I'm a Lana fucking I've got the class stand. that we can go to. Okay. Right, I don't cool. want to say it. Don't say but... it out loud. Okay. That's the Tennessee plans. We'll see you guys there. Can't wait, Knoxville. I'm also considering at the last minute, after we've done all the tailgating, taking a quick ride over to Boone, North Carolina, watch JMU against Appalachian State. That's the real big matchup that's going on in the Smoky Mountains. Are you not going to our game? I am, but I'm, but in in spirit, I'm going to be in Boone, North Carolina. Okay, it's a big matchup. It's it's very big, huge. If y'all win that game, people are talking potentially top twenty five. Who's talking about that? I've I've heard some rumblings. There are some rumblings. Where did you mostly hear it? from Ebo? 
Oh, Ebo said it too. No, I'm just. I mean, they could be. They'd be right there. Yes, yeah, so that's what I said on part of my take yesterday. Big Cat was like, boo, 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 boo. no, they'd be. Not, they'd be getting votes. You're not at better least than for Wisconsin. Sure. Yeah, they they would be getting votes because Appalachian State got 77 votes to be in the top 25. Did he say James Madison wasn't better than Wisconsin? No, I was just doing a big cat impression because he was hating. He, probably. He was just being a hater. They but might, that's fine. I might Hank's Wisconsin. on my side, which is, that's all I need. As long as I got Hank, I got the entire company, baby. Yeah, App State got 77 votes this week. If y'all go in there and win that game, you'll be right there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Big T. Fucking idiots out there don't believe me. Caught some heat on that. There's no bigger second uh, team fan of JMU in the country than me. I've been a JMU guy for two years. There we go. I love it. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard, Big when, T. When we lost to uh, the Sam Houston in the playoffs the other year, crush me. That was bad. That wasn't just the playoffs, buddy. That was the that was the natty S- semifinal. I thought that was the natty. Uh, it was the semi because they went and played. No, uh, that's that was the natty a couple years ago. We lost. It probably was a national championship game because those are two of the best programs. But hang on. Yeah, we lost against North Dakota State last year in the in the semis against that motherfucker Hunter Lepke, who's like the fullback of my dreams, but happens to play for our biggest rival. No, in 2020, Sam Houston played South Dakota State in the national championship. It was the semi. Was that 2020? I'm almost certain they played. Uh... May 8th, 2021. JMU 35, Sam Houston 38. Yeah. That's when we gave up uh, 28 points in the third quarter. Yep. That was tough. Yeah, that game broke me. That was a very, very bad second half. I hated every second of that second half. We had that game won. We're up 27 nothing at halftime. That's tough. I forgot it was that bad. What's worse? Being up 20. Oh, sorry. No, I'm wrong. It was 24 to 3. What's worse, Big T, being up twenty four to three or being up twenty eight to three and losing? Probably twenty eight to three. Yeah, very, very bad. It was a ninety like a ninety seven win percentage, win probability for us. Been there, pal. Yeah. We watched the smartest guys in the room. I've listened to numerous podcasts. Big T, you're correct. It was the semifinals. Yeah. My mistake. No, I remember that's how much it affected me. Yeah. It was I bad. remember the game. It was bad. Um uh, but yeah, uh, Inron, smartest guys in the room. Watch the documentary if you haven't watched it already. I've uh, I've been reading a lot about Inron as well, uh, and it's a fascinating story. It really is. So um, as we heard from Jake earlier, you might know Inron from being the name of Inron Field, where the Houston Astros play. Bill, you were out of the room because um, Jake was in here working and you were doing something else. But um, I asked Jake what he knew about the Inron scandal. He goes, oh, Inron, Inron Field, Houston Astros. Which is a perfect Jake moment. I, I connected Enron to 9-11. That's a perfect Billy moment. So, go on. Go on. Tell me. Well, let's we'll fill us in, but I like... Okay, that's, I what, like, that's what we call I a dug tease. deep. That's what we call a tease I dug in the business. deep. So, um, Enron. Company uh, started... Ken Lay was key in the foundation of Enron. Um, or as George W. Bush called him, Kenny Boy. He was Kenny Boy. And his wife said... Kenny Boy was my nickname for Kenny. Yeah, so George George W. Bush stole Ken Lay's nickname from Ken Lay's wife. Maybe he heard it in uh, him and Barbara. <laughs> what? Who knows? Swingers? Swingers, Kenny, Barbara. Yeah. Billy, George. Did, you, did you take mushrooms this morning? <laughs> no. <laughs> when, did you, when did you last microdose your mushrooms? Can, can everyone lay off? <laughs> okay. I took some I took some lines made this morning. There you go. All right. Uh, so anytime we talk about George W. Bush nicknames for anybody, it's always important to go back and uh, visit some of his best hits. And by that, I just mean go to the nicknames used by George W. Bush Wikipedia page. We're, we're going to go to uh, the foreign leader section today. So he obviously had Kenny Boy for Ken Lay. Uh, for Jean Cretin, the prime minister of, of Canada, he called him Dino. He called him Dino. <laughs> He called Vladimir Putin Pooty Poot or Pooty Poot Ostrich Legs. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, Tony Blair, he called him Landslide <laughs> because he won in a landslide election. So he called him Landslide. <laughs> uh, Landslide's a great name, isn't it? That's pretty good. Sick. Uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, called him Man of Steel. Man of Steel. 
Be- Solid. Because a dude from Australia, he wouldn't he wouldn't leave Iraq, even though um, all of Australia was like, hey, what is Australia doing in this? Please bring our troops home. He's like, that's not how we do things in Australia. We don't pull out halfway. <laughs> and so, uh, so Bush loved that. Then uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, Silvio Berlusconi. Do you know what he called Silvio Berlusconi? Burlesque. Burly. Shoes. <laughs> Hell yeah. Just because he wore Every, nice shoes. Everybody's got a shoes <laughs> yeah. in, in the group. What's up, shoes? That's actually a pretty good nickname. It's not bad. It's what we should call uh, Travi. Yeah. Shoes. I'm going to start calling him shoes. What's up, shoes? For the boys. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was George W. Bush's nickname for, for old Ken Lay. And Ken Lay, um, I heard this, listen to the Dollop podcast, which is a great podcast. If you haven't listened to it, uh, give it a shot. They do various his- historical events and historical people. Um, they said that Kinlay's dad was a traveling stove salesman. Huh. The stove, can you imagine what that would have been like to be a stove salesman? He definitely has tons of half brothers and sisters. Just, just fucking. I mean, traveling salesman. Like, I, I remember I used to watch tons of like TV Land TV yeah. shows like gun smoke and like the traveling salesman was always like a skeevy like trying to sleep with everybody's wives type guy that's the only way you could do it imagine just being on the road all the time no cell phones you just go door to door with your product the only way that you can really do well at your job is if you're able to like flirt with the homemakers that are there get them to like you and, and introduce you to their home and bring you in man and having a stove having a stove is something that like if if somebody has a stove that doesn't work, they probably get a new stove within, I'd say, a couple days. You really have to have perfect timing if you're a traveling door-to-door stove salesperson. I feel like all the door-to-door salesmen have now turned into comedians. Comedians? Like the people that would have been salesmen are now comedians. I think that there's there's some crossover in terms of like the skill, the, road. the skill set that you have to have, be able to tell a story. Um, but really, the the art of the salesperson is kind of going downhill. I know it's all Amazon. It's all online. It's all like the new salespeople are just the new algorithms that that are being coded into uh, into various web browsers and AdSense technology. The people listening on your the phones, yeah, it's your phone, your apps. Yeah, there's no real traveling salespeople anymore anyways um so kinlay uh founded enron and then enron started out as an energy company basically they started out um they had contracts on uh various pipelines and things like that so they would buy oil or buy the rights to transport oil from like an exxon or a mobile bp that type of company and then they get a contract with um a local municipality and be like, okay, we will sell you this oil that we're buying from the producer and you'll pay us to transport it to you and then we'll take our cut and we'll be gone. But then they decided that they wanted to do something a little bit more than that. So they started, you remember in uh, the big short, how people had houses and then you were able to also gamble on the markets without actually taking ownership of any of the you know physical real estate necessary. So like, in the housing crisis, people got loans for houses they couldn't afford, and then um, they bundled all those loans together, and then they sold those big bundles of loans to other companies who would then sell those loans to other companies. And then they created something, I think that was the synthetic- a Mortgage-packed security? Yeah, the mortgage- Mortgage-packed pack, security. Yeah, and then they created the synthetic version of that, which is then people out there could just bet on whether or not your loans would get paid back or not without even yeah. touching any of the stuff that you had in your hands for like the contract of the loan or the uh, the value of the property. People could just bet on whether or not you had made a good bet in business. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what Enron started to to get into. Well, what they exactly, except with oil. Yeah, what they exactly did and shout out Investopedia if you're a finance econ major, uh, this got me through college. Uh, Investopedia was great for this research, but Enron created Enron Online in October 1999. Is this what you're talking about? That that was a little. I think bit, that was after was they a little bit developed later. that, but to trade it at a larger scale. Yeah. Um, it was a trading website that focused on commodities. It was a counterparty to every transaction on EOL, which was the buyer or the seller. Uh, 
to entice participants and trade partners, Enron offered its reputation, credit, and expertise in the energy sector. It was praised for its expansions and ambitious projects and was named America's most innovative company. So they were they were a blue chip. They were they were up there with Apple, Google. Um, yeah, Enron at one point was the seventh biggest company in the United States. Yeah. Which is crazy. I did not realize it was that huge. It's massive. Yeah. What's, what's the seventh biggest company in the United States right now? Let's check it out. I mean, so probably... Google, Amazon, Apple, in the probably US? like McDonald's My- and Microsoft. Coke. Yeah, Microsoft. Uh, largest company. So it's a, like, Dell. who's after that? Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, shit. So okay, that's pretty big. so a company right above, that owns everything. Yeah, and they right, literally own everything. Right above it is ExxonMobil. Yeah, so so that, yeah, gives you, that gives you an example of just, like, how big Enron was. So they were an energy company. Let's start from, like, the 90s. They were an energy company. They employed, um, ended up employing, like, 20,000 people in uh, the greater Houston area. They're the biggest employer down there. As Jake said, they, they named Enron Field uh, after the company Enron. So they were a, a basic energy company. And then they started to bet on uh, energy contracts as well. And the big change for Enron uh, between uh, being just your standard ener- energy company and one that had enormous amount of exposure was when they got the right to uh, go to mark to market accounting. So that is a very interesting concept and one that I heavily, uh, it's it featured in the uh, documentary, Smartest Guys in the Room, but it was something I really wanted to delve into because it just didn't make sense like how they could do this. But basically it allowed them to make up their revenue and profits without actually having to display any of them. So I, I can give you like a, a rough background. I'm sure I'm going to screw some of this up. But um, when you're a publicly traded company like Enron is, you first and foremost have a duty to the shareholders, right? So you want to make sure that your share price goes up, doesn't go down. That's just, that's public company 101. Um, That's your bread and butter. So what would happen would be they, Enron would get these contracts from um, various sources, whether it was like a city or a town or a a government or a large industry, they would get the contracts for the oil to deliver. Um, But then also, what they could do with mark to market accounting is you make them sign like a 20 year deal as opposed to just like a a standard one or two year deal. If you get them to sign a 20 year deal, then you can not only count for the revenue that you're expecting that year or the year after, but you're also counting on revenue that's going to be coming in 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And the best part is for them, they get to make up what they think the price of oil will be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And to them, the price of oil goes up all the time. So if you were to sign a 20 year deal, you could say theoretically, yeah, I think that the price of oil is going to double in in 10 years. So guess what? The $10 million worth of revenue that I'm expecting to get this year, that's actually going to be worth $20 million a year in 10 years. So they, and then they can count all those profits as revenue coming in at that point, that year. So it makes it look like, you know, maybe uh, hypothetically, if they're like a $50 million a year company, it can make you look real quick like you're a $500 million a year company without actually having any money that will ever come through your doors. And what that does is it makes people value your company more from the outside. Stock price, in theory, should go up because you're reporting these numbers. Uh, But in practice, you don't actually have any of the dollars coming in that you say you have coming in. So that was Mark to Market Accounting 101. Probably screwed some of that up. Billy spilled something while we were no, doing no, that. No, I have to. I've been kind of allergies, so I have to blow my nose, but I don't have to do that yet. Um, but what's crazy is they got official U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approval for this in mm-hmm. 1992. Um, this was allowed them to like basically, if they built a power plant and thought that in 10 years it would make them millions of dollars, they could just say it was making them millions of dollars. Yeah, currently. Yeah. Yeah. Which so is it's insane. it's all theoretical stuff. So. Um, the, the underpinnings behind a lot of these things was um, deregulation of the power industry. So when you hear the word deregulation, whenever I hear somebody talk about that, like on the news, my eyes kind of glaze over. It's like deregulation. What the fuck does that mean? Um, Big T, when you think deregulation, what do you think? Uh, less government. Less government. Yeah. Less, less oversight. So um, in energy terms, uh, having turns out having some regulation is a good thing. Because if you don't have any regulation at all, what that means is that the people that are buying energy 
can do whatever the fuck they want and they can they can pay as much money as they want for it and they can hoard it and keep it from people and then when people actually need it then they can charge basically whatever the hell they want yeah. to the people that de that desperately need it. so deregulation is is the premise that um the state government the national government should not have anything to do with the production and distribution of energy which i from a, th a theoretical standpoint excuse me from a theoretical standpoint i i understand why the libertarians feel that way where it's just like the government shouldn't control anything it's just like if you find it if you're able to develop it that's your property um but in practice it just doesn't work at all because mm -hmm. people people like to make money and and right. that's what they're going to do and the people that get into the energy business in particular they're not in it to provide like an ethical service for uh, a reasonable price they're in it because they're trying to get fucking paid so commodities trading in the best way that i learned about it was for example in the midwest the grain traders um, trading was supposed to have a net benefit to society. Like basically if in Kansas city, barley was $5, but in Minneapolis, barley was $2 50 grain traders were trading their barley in order to lower the price in Kansas city. And also, you know, basically where there was demand bring supply. And it was supposed to essentially make prices lower and allow a consumer market where, you know, shortages weren't causing too much of an impact on the consumer. And, you know, it was a uh, resource allocation. And that's how energy trading is supposed to work. But if you're greedy and, you know, if your best interest isn't lowering the price and, you know, for the consumer, but raising uh, shareholders value. Yep then you might try to create artificial scarcity. Well, that's that's exactly what will happen. And and so if you work at a company like Enron and you're an energy trader and your job is to figure out, your job is literally to figure out how to make money, how to make more money off of the, uh, the energy that we have rights to or that we could get rights to, you're going to end up fucking people over. And I think what you'll see is like a lot of what happened at Enron was um, – a group of people who had a very specific job, which was make the company money. And to them, the company was uh, numbers on like a computer screen. And so if they figure out ways to make those numbers go up, they were doing their job correctly. And, and very few of them stopped to think about what was behind all those numbers and what was actually happening in the real world. It was just like, oh shit, I'm killing it. I'm making, I'm getting a $2 million bonus this year. That's good. It's very easy, I think, for people to be in a company like that. See numbers on a screen. You're like, I'm a smart guy. I'm doing a good job because these numbers are going up um, and not actually think about the real world ramifications. But it was it was almost cartoonish. So these guys, I think Mad Dog said before we started recording, like if these guys had just gotten blowjobs, they would never would have done this. It is like in the documentary, they talk about how the two main guys loved to go you know, motocrossing and do all these dangerous activities and they just love to live life on the wild side. Like, go get your dick sucked. Like, I swear to God. Well, well, Lou Pye definitely was. Oh, Lou yeah. Pye was. Lou Pye rocks. <laughs> so yeah. so the, the main guys, Ken Lay was the founder. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Skilling was the, Skilling. the president and COO. Mm -hmm. And so at one point, uh, Skilling, Skilling was a fucking G when it came to bringing the money. I think they were trading... 27 billion dollars per quarter and he had a glow up is, and he did have a glow up so so these guys and then Lou Pai, who was in charge of a very special division of enron mm -hmm. where nobody knew exactly what the fuck Lou Pai did yeah he was just like the vice president of getting shit done and so uh that's the guy that would just fuck bitches get money fuck bitches get money didn't he uh, he would stop by gas stations sometimes? So he would go to strip. Well, it's, it's important to mention what he did before the gas station. Okay, so we ahead. weren't you weren't being euphemistic when you said fuck bitches get money. He went to a strip club like every night. Yeah, and would have sex with strippers, and then at, at somebody asked, "Aren't you worried that like your wife is gonna smell perfume on you or something?" He goes, "Got it covered. I go to a gas station and I." dip a little bit of gas on me so that I smell like gasoline instead of perfume. It's so wild. And then the same guy was like, well, what if your wife thinks you're fucking a gas station attendant? And so then that man was like basically sent away to Calgary. Yeah. He yeah. was like, how and dare you? They, they, then, yeah, they basically did the thing where they put him on a train to Siberia. Yeah. <laughs> and then he got off scot-free. He made out the best out of everybody because he got a stripper pregnant 
got divorced, cashed out his two hundred fifty million dollars in stock, and went away forever. Yeah, and so now he, I think, is or he was the second biggest landowner in Colorado, and so he just bought a <laughs> shitload of land in Colorado. So he was the CEO of Enron Energy Services, and he left in two thousand one, and he was just like, you know what, I'm out, and he didn't get charged with any criminal wrongdoing whatsoever. Um, so he made out like a bandit. I would love to know exactly the man. I would love to know what he did, and he, and and alive? how he made this money. Yeah, he's still alive. He's, be, he's seventy five. What's he up to, Lupa? He's seventy five right now. Um, so yeah, he he was like, he was Jeffrey Skilling's get shit done guy, and uh, he was the guy that was really in charge of, uh, he, like oversaw the shift from being a basic energy company into let's let's do some energy trading where we can bet on the markets and we can move energy around and then bet on how much it's going to be worth as opposed to just doing the thing of transporting from point a to point b and um so you had all these energy traders including lupi um that would they would gamble on whether the price of oil would go up or go down it's like a legalized casino and they were right almost 100 percent of the time somehow and that's obviously impossible to do. You never know. But uh, they figured out that something was up. This is very funny. They figured out something was going on on the trading floor because, uh, well, number one, they were never wrong. And they saw a report about uh, about the, the futures market for oil. And one of the main uh, creators and investors on that was a guy named uh, M. Yas. And they figured out that it meant like my ass. And so they just like they were inventing people to cite in these reports and then doctoring the reports and manipulating the market just because they knew that since it was deregulated, there was nobody that was overseeing any of these markets. They could just make stuff up and they'd make more money off of it. I feel like if you're falsifying things at the level where tens of millions and billions of dollars are at stake, you could take the time to come up with a john stevens you know john dot stevens instead of my ass you would think so but that's not how things work like this in, in a situation where you're making so much money and you feel like you're so so smart and like everything's fast and loose you're living in a casino pretty much you're going to do stuff like that you're going to get on the phone with your boss and say things like yeah so we figured out how to steal the energy from this place and then your boss is going to have to say wait can we just not use the word steal on the phone <laughs> and then you're going to laugh about it because it's funny because there's nobody looking over your shoulder at that time. Um, arbitrage. Arbitrage, baby. <laughs> arbitrage. And the dirt bikes were kind of cool. I got to say, Bad Dog. Like, yes, the, the dirt bikes were awesome. Those dudes rock. Like, in the documentary, they're like, yeah, they loved people who had spikes on them, like a little bit of edge, or they were spiky people. Yeah. And it's like, it is so clear. And they talked about how much everyone at Enron was just nerds. The more insecure yeah. you are, the more they yeah. like you. Yeah. Well, that was the spikes thing was a term for uh, the people who that performance review thing yeah. where they fired the bottom 15% of the company every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just pretty wild. It's like they were just so power hungry because they were nerds in high school and now they have all of this money and power. And it's like, dude, just look, like go get your dick sucked it's just like the easiest solution to this problem and it, and then they didn't yep besides the i noticed that guy. there weren't a lot of like really high up women in the company that's shocking <laughs> there I was mean, that one who said uh should you put your entire 401k in enron stock absolutely yeah, yeah i did i did like that Dumb. lady but yeah no it's, it's it was nerds it was like a, it yeah was just a ton it was just a ton of nerds who are like were base. It felt like they were getting back at like their high school bullies. Yes, it like that's what it it was. It was just so easily, like again, hindsight's twenty twenty. But like when you're watching this, it's like it's so easily like an ego thing. Yeah, and so they were um, a as they converted over to being a trading company. They were very well connected in the state of Texas. Uh, George H W Bush was like best friends with some of them. Uh, George W Bush became very very close to them, and George W Bush. Um, ended up doing a couple favors for them politically. And I think Enron was the largest contributor to George W. Bush's presidential campaign. And um, a lot of people on Capitol Hill, though. So it wasn't just a uh, George W. Bush thing. A lot of people on Capitol Hill were close with Enron. And they asked one of the guys about that. And he was like, well, yeah, it's not it's not a left thing or a right thing. It's just I don't know how you can say it's a political thing. They they contribute to everybody. 
Yeah, that makes it a political thing because you do contribute. They bought off Congress, essentially. And what they wanted was more deregulation because the less rules that are surrounding the energy industry, the more ways that they can figure out how to dress things up and make it look like they're making money um, while actually making life worse for a lot of people. So uh, another example of what happened um, when they were uh, kind of like spending lavishly on these dirt bikes as the company was coming up, they uh, Ken Lay had the, the Lay family jet. So the company just gave them a private jet. And at one point they sent a private jet to Monaco to drop off Ken Lay's daughter's bed. <laughs> Think about that. That was like a company expense was my daughter lives in Monaco. First of all, if you're living in Monaco, you you can probably afford a bed. Yeah. It's the richest country on earth. And they sent her bed over on a plane. They transported a bed via a private jet to Monaco so that their daughter could have a bed to sleep in. That's wild. Kind of crazy. So they're, they're making money hand over fist is the point. And, um, their, their tagline was, we're not the Walmart of natural gas. We're the Mercedes Benz, <laughs> which is such a sweet thing to say. Cause like it's gas. We're not the Walmart of podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder if, uh, no, we are <laughs> we're, we're definitely maybe the family dollar. No, we're the, we're the, we're the Rickies. Oh, actually, I don't think that's a nationwide. No, we're the, we're the Spencer's Gifts. Yeah, we're the Spencer's of Gifts. Podcast, or the Hot Topics. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's such a cool thing to say because gas is gas. It's But if you just tell people like, yeah, sorry, you're going to have to pay more money to get our gas. Our gas is the good gas. <laughs> it kind of makes you want to pay. We got that gas. Like if somebody has that, that confidence to come and be like, yeah, listen, you could buy their gas, I guess, but you don't want. There was yeah. nothing like the first day you went in the back of a Spencer's gift shop. <laughs> yeah. just, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the shit that you like, you, it was like almost something. I'm trying to think of the word for Coming it. Coming of age. It, no, not even that. Like it was like, it, it felt like it was like a myth. The, like yeah. the stuff that was back there. And then the first time you show up, you're like, oh my God, what is yeah, this Yeah, because it's like everything that they have everywhere you look is another thing that you feel like you're not supposed to be looking at. Yep. <laughs> like you're bad for being in there. Yeah, your mom like gives you money and tells you like go around the mall and you're like, I know the first place I'm going. Yep. Spencer's <laughs> Gifts, baby. Hell yeah. Has anyone ever actually bought anything from in there? Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah, for sure. They're still in business. I bought some leather gloves in there. What'd you need those <laughs> Just for? Just like a year ago. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> they had spikes and shit on them. They were cool. I think They're, I bought an M and M shirt in there. No, I bought I bought leather gloves. I I was bringing them back. I forget for what reason, but I was going to give them to Nick, and then I had a pair too. It's for some video that we're making. I think actually, you know what the the thing is? When Nick went to Spencer's Gifts, he went to a mall that had Spencer Gifts with Jeff D. Lowe. I gave him like a hundred bucks, and I was like, buy me something cool from Spencer's Gifts. So I was then buying him something from Spencer's Gifts. They also had a hat in the back that was just like a baseball cap with like a nine inch penis that was just protruding from the front of it. And I wanted to get it, but my mom was in the car and then I didn't want my mom to be like, Hey, where would you get in the mall? <laughs> Joey told me that those are called unicorn hats. You yeah, Okay. I like it. It makes sense. Anyways, we're the Spencer's gifts of podcasting. hundred percent. Uh, but so Enron was like, yeah, we're the, we're, we're the Mercedes Benz. At least, at least make it like we're the Saks fifth Avenue compare a store to a store. Right. Like you're comparing a car to a to a Walmart. That's kind of weird. Um, so they were they were charging more for their their better gas that they were getting. Um, but and, yeah, should we get into the fall? Yeah, we can get into the fall. Uh, I I also thought it was funny how they were making all these friends in like super high places because they were printing money. All their executives were making money hand over fist because they were essentially just they were trading things that didn't really exist and making up their own numbers, but the stock price kept going up. So when the stock price goes up, that means that they make more money. That means that the people that work for the company, their 401ks go up because everybody's 401k is invested in the Enron stock. So everybody was doing real, real well, making money, even though they weren't making more money than they had before. In fact, they might've been making less money than they had been making before in terms of real dollars coming in from their customers. So uh, they start, making all these friends in high places. And the, the funniest scene I thought in the movie was they had Alan Greenspan 
come to hang out with him for a day. Alan Greenspan was the the head of the federal, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and they just gave him, they just gave him an award for being an outstanding man, and and he's like they're accepting the award for like doing great things as a, as a human being. It was like the humanitarian great person of the year award presented by Enron. When a company is giving an award for being a, a good guy to the person who's in charge of dictating financial policy to the world. Like you think, you think there's something behind that? You think, or do you think they actually thought that Alan Greenspan was just like the coolest guy? Just being nice to their guests. Uh, yeah. Is that like a normal thing for companies we, to just recognize people as being great as that a, don't work there? You know what? For every new guest, we should do that. Give them an award? Yeah. For being an outstanding person. It's, it's like an honorary degree to whoever speaks at your graduation. You, yeah. you now have a doctorate from the University of Tennessee. And is there ever a reason that uh, even a university would, there's always like something going on behind the scenes. They're not just, they're not just giving a doctorate to Bill Cosby because they think he's a smart guy, you e know? Elon Which Musk. Which Temple did. If you want an honorary awesome person of the year for macrodosing, come on. Come on the show. Yeah, no, I, I, will, give, I will give a plaque to anybody with over a million Twitter followers that comes on part of, or that comes on macrodosing. The Taliban? Do they have do, over a million? I, mean, I don't know. I know they're on. I mean, I, I said what I said. <laughs> well, what? Honestly... <laughs> We can interview them. Billy, would, would you want to go over there in person? We'll send you. Put on a I khaki would, vest. Yeah. Give you a helmet. Okay, let's role play. Okay. I'm the leader of the Taliban. Yeah, I just invited you. Welcome to my cave. Sup? Dead. <laughs> you can't say sup. You don't open with a sup. Okay, okay. Uh, do they... Yeah, how, how do they greet you'd each other? You'd be so bad. You'd be so bad at this. You're already dead three I, times. I know, but I don't want to... Thank you for having me. You're welcome. What did you want to talk to me about? Uh, wanted to ask you to come on macrodosing. Okay. Uh, can we do it right now? Yes. Okay, now I'm on macrodosing. Hi, Here, Billy. Here's your microphone. Okay. Uh, all these years combating U.S. troops, what uh -huh. was your main belief that kept you going through the hardest times? All right, so now you're now you're doing a puff piece on the Taliban. <laughs> no, no, we're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> you're like the uh, you're like the Tom Rinaldi for war criminals. It's like, Taliban <laughs> misunderstood? Question mark. <laughs> yeah, How, we, got the, football. we got the tinkly piano going on in the background right now. How? What was your? Uh, what was the strangest things uh, that you noticed about Americans who were here? Nice. Now, so now we're doing like follies. Billy would <laughs> like terrorism Bill, follies. Billy wouldn't come back. He would get radicalized. He would. He no. Would, what? Yeah. He'd be like, you know, this caliphate they keep talking about sounds like a strong idea. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's just dudes rolling around the desert and they get falcons? <laughs> yeah, that right. It's like, yeah, let's, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it. It's they, like if, if you built an entire desert out of New Hampshire. <laughs> it sounds awesome. They they drink tea. Be careful I like of those tea. fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> no alcohol. That will be tough for you. They have opium. They do. They chew it. You know that they like dip opium. Yeah, they dip opium. They they uh, chew on cat, cot, cot, k a t. That's one drug I really want to try. Actually, have you ever actually? Those seen... are the drugs that they they do in Captain Phillips when have, they're taking over the, the boat. Have you seen the Vice documentary about the the dog fights in Afghanistan? I have not. Wild. The dogs are gigantic. They're like specimens. I think they have Tibetan mastiffs over there. I, I think they're like their own. I think they're Caucasian shepherds. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're Those like cool. like crazy. Big and dogs. So I had a friend who's Russian, um, first generation American, and their family brought over their Caucasian shepherd uh, in gigantic dog. Imagine Great Dane, sort of like bulldoggy face, but furry. Yeah. Used to fight off bears and wolves from their livestock. Um, killed two dogs first two months. What'd they do? They had to put it down. Yeah. Probably after the first dog, they probably probably should have put it down. Yeah. Well, the first dog jumped into their yard, so it doesn't count. Okay. It Legally. provoked him. Yeah. Okay. Um, interesting. So, yeah, Billy would come back radicalized. Well, he just probably wouldn't come back. If he did come back, it'd be like in, in Homeland, where Brody came back after being held hostage for so long, then tried to kill the vice president. Never saw that show. Uh, yeah. great. Season one, awesome. Is that like 24? Kind of, yeah. It's Claire Danes. Is the whole... It's it's if 24 instead of Keith or Sutherland had Claire Danes uh, hyperventilating all the time and listening to jazz music. Quick question. Was 24... Was the whole show over 24 hours? 
Good question, Billy. Yes. So was the show longer than 24 hours? Like actually? I think it was 24. I don't know. I actually never saw 24, but I do know the concept of it. Cause that's a crazy 24 hours. Yeah. Pretty wild. I, that's one, you know what? I need to fucking watch 24. That's one that I, I just, it's a cultural, it's a touchstone in American culture that I have not participated in, but I do know the concept of it. It used to come on after the Simpsons and King of the Hill on Sunday nights. Each season covers 24 consecutive hours. So is it 24 episodes per season? Uh, one second. So yeah, Billy would come back like like Brody and um, and be a secret terrorist. So we will not be sending Billy overseas and we will not. Well, I'm not going to come. Come on. Okay. If you go overseas, you're staying over there. <laughs> not coming back. There are 192 episodes over nine seasons. So like 21-ish per season. There should be 24 per season, but I get it. He's got to be like, why does this keep happening to me? Why do I keep having the worst days? <laughs> I've had seven really bad days. It's September recently. again. Some bad shit's <laughs> about to happen. Yeah. Astrology is real. <laughs> For sure. Uh, so, okay. Back to Enron. Where were we? So, Enron started to get in some bad business ventures. Bad business ventures. Good point. One Billy. of them was good. Like, if you look at it. Like futuristically, oh, yeah, like, for the traders at the time, they're right. making they're making a ton of money. No, but one of their uh, business ventures that they try to do, and they linked up with Blockbuster, was they tried to do on demand video. They tried to do yeah. what Netflix does now, but twenty years ago. Yeah, they did. So part of that venture was they were um, they tried to think of other things that they could sell uh, because they're selling contracts on oil, so they're not actually selling the oil necessarily, but they're selling rights to the oil. Um, they were trying to sell bandwidth, mm. so they were so internet bandwidth. So they were saying if you um, if you go to bed at eleven p.m. every night and you wake up at eight a.m. every night, why that's nine hours where you're not using your internet. That's nine hours of hypothetical internet that somebody else could be using. That's space online someone else could be using. People should be able to sell that and sell the bandwidth that they don't use. If you think this sounds insane, it's because it is insane. If you think that there's no chance in hell that this would work, you are correct. There's no chance that it would work. But I think they still sold like $80 million worth of bandwidth contracts and never actually traded any bandwidth whatsoever. Because again, the way I'm explaining to you is the way that they had thought it up and there's no possible way that it can work. Yeah, internet doesn't work like that. It doesn't. But it's at the time, like commodity. at the time, people thought that it might. They were just trying to be the first to the market. So Billy, let me let me fire back at you. I'm gonna put on my Kinlay hat for a second. Okay. Okay, so it didn't work. But what if it had? Then we could just say it did. But what if it had what if what if it had worked? So the way that, that Kinlay and Enron and a lot of people that are very savvy business people think sometimes is they think to themselves, uh, what's the old phrase? It's like if you hit a target, you're talented. If you hit a if you hit a target that no one can see. You're a genius, you know? Huh. So like if you're told, okay, we need to figure out a way to sell $100 million with the energy contracts this year, you figure out a way to do it, you're fucking awesome at your job, great job. But if you invent the concept of trading energy contracts on an open marketplace, you're a genius because you can make so much more money and nobody even knew that that market existed. Right process, wrong result. Yes. So they, they could just keep making shit up until something work they could be like we're gonna uh we're gonna sell rights to uh to hamburger meat hypothetical contracts on on hamburger meat they you could make anything up that they were trying to sell but they saw that the internet was becoming a massive massive deal so they said okay let's try to sell space on the internet that people aren't using um it didn't work but they still said that it was going to work they actually they kind of glossed over this in the documentary but they tried to trade weather yeah i didn't uh understand how that worked so um it sounds great it absolutely sounds like it could be a winner uh but they never really they never got into what exactly they were trading maybe they're just like gambling on the weather so okay here's uh here's what i found from a cnn article so if this is wrong big t i apologize uh 10 years ago the enron corporation sold the first weather futures agreeing to pay a utility company $10,000 for each degree that it fell below the average temperature during winter. That's actually not a bad idea. 
just essentially betting on the weather with energy companies. I kind of like that. What do you think, Big T? Do you follow that? I mean, yeah, I guess. It obviously was coming from a company that didn't really know what the fuck it was doing, so... They were basically trying to trying to create whatever market they could right. based on the knowledge that they had of how much oil was going to cost in any certain place at any certain time. That's kind of where they're coming from. And so then they put locked a bunch of guys in a room and said, okay, figure out a way to make money. And then they opened the doors up and they're like, okay, what are your ideas? Let's do them. Make us money, please. In fact, one time when they got caught... Um, making up profits that they that were coming in and making up uh, different investment reports. Um, they sent them a note. They didn't discipline them at all. They sent them a note saying, just please keep making us millions. Thank you for doing your job. So the, uh, the, the trading part of Enron, which is uh, bringing in all the money, was the only successful part of the company. And they weren't doing anything except for just trading money on uh, completely speculative markets. So then they deregulate California. Billy, do you have anything on what happened in California? So California, because of the deregulation, became target of a lot of Enron's energy trading. So real quick to, to tell you what happened in California was the state legislature in California decided to uh, remove all the rules and restrictions on who could buy energy and who could sell energy and for what prices from the power plants that were in California making energy for Californians. So what does that mean? That means that there is a power plant in California that creates the electricity and sends it out to Californian homes. What the deregulations did was it allowed Enron to come in there and buy the electricity directly from the power plant, send it out of state, redirect it, and then resell it back into California. Why would they want to do that? Well, because if it's being sold from a different state, they don't have to follow any price restrictions. So they could take that electricity, send it out of state, and then sell it back in, make more money. And uh, there were there were some other things that were going on in terms of how they were dealing with the power plants themselves. Basically, what they did is they created a false fake demand. They would shut down power. After taking the power out of the state, they would then shut down power plants in the state and cause the price of electricity to go up and then sell back that energy that went out of state at a much higher premium. So they This would, was the arbitrage they were looking for. Yeah, so they would... Correct me if I'm wrong, Billy, but um, since they were buying such an enormous amount of electricity, what they could do, since Enron, the company, had so much money, they could, they were like, they were big players. The electric companies knew that Enron was buying so much of their power that if Enron's people got on the phone and said, hey, can you just shut down for a couple hours and then we'll go back up? They were like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You're my we're in business together. Yeah, they're entertaining their clients. They're, yeah, exactly. They're, Thank you, Billy. This, yeah. When entertaining clients goes wrong, the Enron well, story sometimes, of California. Sometimes you, your clients don't have your best interests. So, you know, it can mess up your own function. That's true. So, yeah, good point, Billy. So in this instance, Billy Football is a power plant in California. Right. And then um, Enron is a lacrosse team. <laughs> And and the lacrosse team is like, hey, Billy, uh, like you have to come out with us and drink these beers. And Billy's like, no, there are a lot of people out there that need me to work tomorrow because they listen to my podcast. So I, I'm going to have to not hang out with you. I have to go in because I'm being responsible and there's right. there's a job that needs to be done. But power plants. And then the lacrosse team is like, <laughs> but like honestly, we give you so much content that it's kind of disrespectful for you. It's disrespectful if you don't hang out with us because we pay your bills because we're a lacrosse team that you talk about. And then Billy was like, fine, I guess I'm going to have to do this. And that's how Enron happened. Yeah. Except the power plant would go down, they would create artificial scarcity, and then guess what happens to the price of power in California? It goes it goes way up. So your average people aren't able to afford their energy bill. Imagine what was the biggest energy bill that was coming into these people? I think they there was going from a four to five dollar a gigawatt, some measure of watt 
up to I think five hundred or a thousand dollars because of the the uh, how much of a shortage and this caused tons of rolling blackouts in California, which caused n- numerous amounts of deaths complications. I mean, when there's no power to, I mean, when we were driving through Tennessee through that ice storm and there was no power, like we were crossing train tracks and I realized halfway through, I was like, look, these train tracks aren't going to close because there's no power. So a train could be coming and we have no idea. So if we had not looked both ways when crossing the train tracks, we could have been hit by a train. And who knows how many times stuff like that happened in California while these blackouts happened, how many ambulances couldn't get somewhere because of traffic, how many car crashes because there was no lights on the, uh, you know, stoplights, how many people died on life support because their hospital couldn't get power. Like this is some evil villain shit. It is bad stuff. And it was all because people that were sitting in the Enron offices, they wanted to see the price of electricity go up because that meant that they were making more money when when that price got higher and so then that number on their computer would make their bottom line go higher and then that would make their stock go higher and then everybody would be happy except the actual people that were at the very end of it so um it was it cost i think like the estimated cost was 45 billion dollars to the people of california and um that's a good point billy like imagine Imagine how many like potential future podcasters Word. got hit by a train because they didn't have the. But the the craziest part of this whole story, uh, which sort of kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things, the governor back then of California, forgetting his name, he was Gray Davis, Gray Davis, Democrat, because of this whole uh, blackout, people were angry. People were blaming him for this when he was fighting for regulation from the federal government who's, you know, Dick Cheney, George Bush, who was just like, no, this isn't a federal problem. And Gary was like, yes, it is. Like, that's in our state laws. You guys control this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it it ended uh, ended with him not getting reelected. And it ended with a newcomer to politics in a whole getting elected, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. Yeah, great. Honestly, I'm I'm happy that Arnold Schwarzenegger got elected governor just because it didn't affect me at all. And that's hilarious. But Gray Davis really got fucked in all this. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't know anything about the guy or or the rest of his policies, but I do know that the deregulation stuff happened. That was not his issue. And that directly caused the rolling blackouts that he was trying to fight against. And then people blamed him for it. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger, he really got fucked on that one. Like, Gray Gray Davis has to be sitting in a room somewhere being like, I told you, like, it wasn't my fault. Arnold. Arnold did it. Arnold. I think they might even be friends right now. But um But it's but like I didn't know Arnold was skeevy like that. Well, I don't think Arnold was that skeevy. They just he got recruited to run for governor and he wanted to he wanted to be governor. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger's a good dude. I don't know. I don't think he was on some Brett Favre shit. I think I, that was he might have been on some Brett Favre shit. I don't think he was. I, I, I like Arnold. I like him a lot. Um Has he been on what? Arnold, if you'd like to explain your side of the story, please come on Macrodosing. We'll give you an award. How about that? Yes, an award for best person who didn't cause blackouts. Yeah, for we'll give you an award for number one governor that didn't know what was actually behind the California blackouts. And wasn't born in the United States. And is a great American. Yes. Perfect. Na- naturalized. Naturalized citizen. And a Kennedy. And yes. he's a Kennedy. How about that? Uh, so... These different policies that Enron came up with, this is a great part too. Um, And this goes back to Big T, what we were talking about earlier with if you're in the process of committing fraud, but you feel like you're getting away with it and making a lot of money, how arrogant you get. So like they put the name my ass on the report. Um, They came up with different names for the projects that they were using to make money in California. And uh, the name that they came up with for their most, uh, I guess, effective strategy was called Death Star. So they just called it Death Star. Just asking to get caught. <laughs> just, you're asking to get caught, but they were just, they knew that this was, so, I think deep down they knew that they were fucking people over. They didn't think about it too much, but they knew that what they were doing was just like, this is bad, but we're making money. Um, so that was how they would shuffle energy around. I'm reading from Wikipedia right now. Uh, the practice of shuffling energy around the California power grid to receive payments from the state for, quote, relieving congestion. According to the company's own memo, memo, they would be paid for moving energy to relieve congestion without actually moving any energy or relieving any congestion. 
If you think that sounds like fraud, I think it's because it is fraud uh, by by like the letter of the law. Or what was, how Ja Rule put it? It's not fraud, that's false advertising. <laughs> right? Big difference, Ja. Um, also, Billy McFarlane, come on the podcast. Oh, yeah. He, I think he's out of prison. Can we try to get him say, on? Is he not in jail anymore? Let's get him on. Is he in prison? No, he's out. We should get him and the situation and just have what him about talk the, about prison. What about the Pharma Bro? Would you be interested in having I've, him on? I've already done an interview with the Pharma Bro. He's We're in a band together. We started a band in 2016. One of the first episodes of part of my take. Oh, yeah. He was going viral for saying some dumb shit. I forget what it well, was. Well, he was also for uh, raising the price. Yeah, for, ra- for raising for the price the on the medication. Bro. Yeah. And so we had him on the podcast and he said that he would start a band with us. And then I think I told him that I fucked his mom or something. I forget. I, did I'll, he... Did, did he actually get that Wu-Tang album? I think he got it taken away. He might have gotten it taken away, yeah. Um, justice okay. for Shkreli. So, uh, so, yeah, yeah. So back to back to this real quick, and let's do get Billy McFarlane on the podcast. I would love to have him. Um, <laughs> Bro, what happened? <laughs> so here's an example of how Death Star worked. If the California power grid was congested with energy flowing south, Enron would then schedule energy to be transmitted north to Oregon. So then Enron would receive a payment from California for relieving congestion on the grid. Then Enron would schedule the energy to be transferred back to its point of origin, but not through California. So then the energy would end up right back where it started, and Enron would be paid by California without actually putting any electricity on their grid. So traders could buy power at 250 bucks, sell it for 1200 and there was zero legal issue for it whatsoever. Kind of crazy. Kind of crazy that they were just like directing power out of the state. They also had other uh, code names for their projects called Fat Boy. Remember Fat? You know what Fat Boy is? Mm-hmm. Fat Boy is the name of the the second atomic bomb I think that was dropped in World War II on Nagasaki. So first yeah. one. What? Do you remember the first one? It was Little Little Boy and Fat Man. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yes, yeah, so this is a combination of the two. It's called Fat Boy? Uh, so this is called Fat Boy. So yeah. that involved overscheduling power transmission. So, uh, for example, to a company subsidiary that did not really need it, then Enron would sell the excess power to the state at a much higher price. There was one called Ricochet. And Ricochet oh. was the power equivalent of a land flip. So you bought in-state power and then you'd flip it out of state and then resell it to California. That's what we were talking about earlier. So at the imported price, that's where, oh, this is the Mercedes Benz of power that we're sending it's you. Because imported. It's imported, it's exotic because we sent it, we sent it to Flagstaff for like 50 minutes, so we're gonna sell it back to you now. Uh, and that got around the in-state regulations of how, how much you could sell energy for. Black Widow, that's another good name. So- Totally not evil at all. No, so they would, uh, they would put errors into, potentially money losing transactions. And then they would use those errors to invalidate transactions when they lost money. Uh, there was Bigfoot that was pretty cool, low electricity bids, but they'd signed them as a competitor uh, oh, to pressing energy prices to enable low price Enron purchases and then get shorty. That was Enron. Se- great movie, by the way, Enron selling electricity that doesn't own. So it depresses demand and then it buys back the the uh, notional electricity at lower prices, so it would sell electricity. That, it would sell electricity that didn't own, which makes the value of electricity much lower because uh, there's not a market for it. And then they would buy that fake electricity back at a low price, and then they would sell it again once the price went higher. Again, if you think that this sounds insane it's because it is a hundred percent actually insane so um they basically fucked over the state of california for a couple years and people's electricity bills skyrocketed the funniest scene i thought in the movie was the lady that brought the pie to the meeting do you remember that the blueberry pie there was a a, a, so skilling was at like a, a public i don't know if it was a town hall meeting or what but this lady brought a blueberry pie with her uh, because her electricity bill had gone up and he was fucking over the state so oh, yeah, hard. He threw, yeah. And she threw a pie and it hit him right in the head. 
and it left him covered from like head to toe with this blueberry pie dripping down the side of his face. We don't pie people enough in public anymore. I wait. Uh, we got. Uh, don't want to say that. Just kind of asking for people to pie us. Well, I, we're not the first. Yeah, I know. But it, it, it's it's very funny. We should pie more more fraudsters. Yes. in public. Who, who should we make a pie hit list? You can, yeah. That's um, a good project for you, Bill. Parody law. Yeah. Pie hit list. This is all joke. This is all joke. Number one. I don't think we're going to agree. Bill on Cosby. This list. Bill Cosby. Yeah. Uh. Wait. What was the? Uh, what possibly could the please don't pie Bill Cosby side of this equation? I don't know because up? what if he accidentally like gets hit with it then falls and like. Dies? Oh no. Can I? Can I? Oh pie? no. Then the then the violent rapist is dead. I know, but I don't want that on my conscience. Can I pie someone? You'd be like a hero. Yeah. I know, I know, but let's... This is like very complicated. I'm, but let's mention Bill Cosby a lot on this podcast. I'm okay with pieing Bill Cosby. Can yeah. we pie the Nelk boys? Okay. No, because then they're going to retaliate, and they have violent fans. Can I pie the Nelk yes, boys? Yes, you can. Okay. You can say whoever. This is a free Steve space. Steve will do it. We may never see you again, but yeah. This is a free space for, for advocating public pieing. Um, oh, Bill de Blasio. Get okay. him. Get his ass. Big T, who do you want to pie? I like how Billy is like... Ob yeah, fuck Ob Bill de Blasio. Ob Bill Cosby? Uh, no, Ob but I don't Oberman, him. yeah. I don't, but like yeah. he's old. I don't want him to get hit with a pie and then fall over and die. De Blasio's old too, right? Yeah, yeah but he's old. tall. There'd be no shame in pieing Keith Olbermann the face on his balcony, and if he fell, he falls. Yeah, he really, he's just, he's the absolute worst. I actually might be see. Uh, never mind. I'll tell you guys after the show. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'm okay with pieing. Who's the guy in the Houston Texans? Jack Easterby. Pie that guy. Roger Goodell. Yeah, pie Goodell. Mm -hmm. Pie Goodell. I feel why like not? He'd be, he'd be a good pie. Deshaun Watson. Pie yep. him. Pie him. Pie him. Pie him. Yeah. Pie him. Some pie. Pie him. Double pie. If you're in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area, pie Deshaun Watson. He's he's a kinky fuck though. He'd probably like that. Gets <laughs> <laughs> pied and nuts. <laughs> he might. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this guy got pied. It was, that kind of rocked when he got took that blueberry pie to his face. Uh, and then yeah, so then Arnold Schwarzenegger got elected off of all this. And then the government finally did some investigations. They uh, they got some guys to flip from the C-suite um, in exchange for lesser sentencing. One of the guys had to pay back, I think, twenty three million, and he testified against the other guys in the C-suite. And uh, I think he got. He got 10 years in prison. The other guys spent longer times in prison. Some of them had a heart attack, which is good. Uh, and then, yeah, that's kind of that kind of leads us to where we are today uh, in terms of the whole regulatory conversation. So I was picking on Big T earlier, but I do actually think that, like, when somebody says deregulate, it's because they want to make money off of rules being taken away entirely. So you should also – you should always be like, wait, what – what if this person gets their way? What's the worst that could happen? And in this case, like I really do think that it's just human nature that if you have a giant company that's in charge, like their their entire thing is making a lot of money, um, and that's what they have to do, they're going to figure out ways to lie and cheat to make all that money. You should always kind of should be wary of those type of people. Um, also involved in the scandal were uh, the investment banks because Enron was such a big company and making so much money in Wall Street. They took a bunch of investments, a bunch of loans. Uh, I, I, I delved into this deeply because I didn't understand it. Shout out Investopedia one more time. But uh, to hide a lot of their debts from a lot of their failed um, you know, ventures, one of which being a huge power plant in India, which backfired because no one wanted to touch India because at the time they built this huge power plant and guess what India couldn't pay for the power because it was too expensive because it was a lot of power and it was a state-of-the-art facility uh, more on that later maybe in connection to 9-11 um, so uh, this guy Fastow who I'm forgetting his first name oh yeah that guy Fastow that guy's his job was to just like talk to investment yeah, banks so right? he was the CFO and basically he orchestrated a scheme to use off-balance sheet special purpose vehicles, SPVs as they're called, uh, whose basically only purpose in creation was to remove some of uh, Enron's debt 
and by doing that is basically Enron would be now I might butcher this, but I think I got a I explained the whole concept okay. ideally. So Enron has debt. Mm -hmm. These companies who are backed by Enron stock are taken to various investment firms, be it venture capitalist firms, all the big players, Chase, Morgan Stanley. Um, I think uh, uh, the Lehman brothers back when they were around were created. And basically they gained financing and this guy, Fastow, who was the CFO at the time, was marketing them to all these banks. And he was a really good s salesman. He was going in front of all these bank boards and being like, look, you want to invest in this company? It does this. It's an energy company. It's basically just buying Enron assets, yada, yada, yada. And basically, they're using those small companies to get money from banks. And then with that money, they basically pay off Enron's debts and take on Enron's debt. And they're not doing it. It's like in a really roundabout way, whereas Enron's in debt will use the money from these uh, shell corporations basically to pay those debts, but then that shell corporation's in debt. And what ends up happening is, is those shell corporations take on a ton of debt, but they're backed by Enron stock. So what that means is, is that these banks can't get their money back because they they all have vested interest in Enron stock, and if they were to like try to get those companies to collect on basically collect on their debts, that would cause Enron stock to go down and impact them. So yep. they have a vested interest to not collect those debts because it's keeping Enron afloat. They didn't at, they when they were first being marketed, they didn't really pick it up, but then they got like oh that's where we're going with this and became complicit in allowing it to happen. So. Uh, it's kind of a natural thing too, yeah. Uh, because it, if the company you work for has so much financially leveraged in these clients, it's another classic case of entertaining clients. Yeah, the clients were being entertained. Yes, actually, it's a great explanation for how most business frauds take off. I mean, I would have been a great employee at Enron. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that that's a ringing endorsement of yourself, Billy. It's true. Joke, it's true, though. Billy would. Billy's All a the big, clients would have been so entertaining. Billy's a big time go along to get along kind of guy. <laughs> that, yeah, I wouldn't actually. Road, I have a much higher moral compass than people think. The road to I donated a bunch of uh, school supplies to an elementary school yesterday. Just wanted you, to put that. Would you call there. them school equipment? School equipment. <laughs> uh, the, the road to hell is paved with entertained clients. <laughs> Um, like the most entertained of all time. That's that's what was happening on. It was just yeah. It was a big orgy of clients that right. that between um, the states themselves, uh, the people in the legislatures, the company, and in the investment banks, just all making each. Every, everyone was happy. Everyone was making money, but they were lying about all the stuff. So it was passing the buck. It was passing the buck. And so this dude, the CFO, he was in charge of yeah, like Billy said, moving the the debt around inside the company. So they would just create new shell companies. And then um, the credit ratings people, and you'll remember them from the big short, how the credit ratings people were uh, more or less paid off by the banks because they were getting so much business from the banks in terms of rating their shit that uh, the ratings agencies would never go out on a limb and say, hey, I think that this product that you're selling is very risky. That's exactly what was happening. And they had the CFO um, was in charge of doing like internal audits at Enron. And so all the credit rating agencies were like, yeah, we have complete, they have, they do the best risk assessment. They have a guy whose entire job is just assessing risk inside any deal that's over $500,000 at Enron. So we have complete confidence in them. Turns out the guy that was assessing the risk is also the guy that's in charge of all the finances at Enron. So is that guy going to lie to the investment banks? You bet your ass he is and you bet your ass he did. And so the investment banks turned a blind eye and everybody made money once again. Uh, Merrill Lynch actually bought uh, Nigerian barges. Yeah, that was from Enron. <laughs> that was just to get them off Enron's book. So Enron was coming up at like the end of a quarter and they were like, hey, uh, Merrill Lynch, our stock's going to go down because we've got a lot of money tied up in these barges that are that are right. in Nigeria. So, so could you just, could you buy these barges from us for four months and just so you can get them off our books and then we'll buy them back after the quarter's over so it looks like we made more money yeah. off, off this, this boat sale that we had? This concept's pretty weird. 
because I was I, I wanted to really understand this stuff so I could explain it on the podcast because but basically what that move did was okay, so I'm Merrill Lynch, PFT's Enron, and that cup of uh homophobic chicken soda mm-hmm. is the tankers. So Yeah, I, I hear you big T. I give him a dirty look too. Uh that was a joke. I didn't want to give free ads. Um but if I'm like so you're like, I'm in debt. I'm not going to do well. And it's in my best interest for you to do well. So you're like, okay, I will give you money because I have unlimited money. I'm a bank uh, so that you can be in the positive if you give me that uh, soda that is weighing mm-hmm. down your finances. So I get the soda. Okay. So now you're good. You're square. And I gave you unlimited money. So yeah this is unlimited now, money now the zen that billy just gave me is money Got yeah it. so now you're you're looking good your share price goes up i'm happy you're happy so now i have this but you're gonna have to buy it back for me okay because that was the deal so you are going to then borrow more money from me okay can i get some more money to get here's, my here's more money okay and then i'm going to i just wait yeah, so then you're gonna give me back money. Yep. All the money that you gave me. All yeah, right. yeah, all and then the money, I'm gonna get my soda back. You're gonna though. get your this soda back. Interesting example. But guess what? That debt that you now have to me, because yeah. you borrowed the money from me, mm-hmm. is now going to your shell corporation. Well and all yeah, and also you know So the sh- the debt is now with Avery. And you know what? Uh the price of the stock went up because I didn't have this homophobic chicken soda on my books when the quarter was over. So that means that guess what? My company made money. You also made money yes. as the investment bank because you owned so much of my company. Exactly. So your price went up too. So and as we long just, as as long as nobody if you just move money around enough and it's you all keep counting. Yeah. If you just keep creating new companies inside your own company and moving money around and transferring it, you don't actually have to bring in any new money at all if you can just make it look like you're making money. You, yeah. If you just make it look like you're making money, your stock price can go through the roof. And it did. It was people were eating high off the hog for a long Hell time. Hell yeah. It was it was a good time to be living in Houston back then. Actually, I actually have to ask Arian about that. Although that was uh that's pre that's pre Arian. He probably has some stories though, because everybody in Houston uh, worked, worked, for at, Enron. worked for Enron but, or knew somebody that worked so, for Enron at the time. And then shit hit the. F- should we get to the shit hitting the fan? Yeah, I mean, we we talked about it a little bit already, but shit hit it. the fan. But this is who it impacted. Enron had bought up a lot of small uh, electric companies with the deregulation of California, just so they can control the supply chain uh, and you know be a top down monopoly almost. So like Portland Electric Grid, Port. Uh, I forget the exact one, but basically there was a bunch of former government workers who are now bought up by a privatized company. They were using the 401ks to buy government, uh, buy this private company's shares that were doing well for the time being. And everyone, and you know, at the time everything was good, but shit hit the fan when a Wall Street Journal journalist started to peck around. Mm-hmm. She was like, hey, wait. You know, this is going too well. Uh, this is going really well. Let's let's just, you know, poke around, ask some questions, see what's happening, and uh, publish a report and just like say, hey, is, is, is Enron overvalued? A common article for many overvalued or successful companies to try to, you know, they're journalists. They're just poking at things. Like mm-hmm. is, is Josh Allen overrated? Is, you know. <laughs> let's talk about it. Is, is he? He's got a rocket arm. Does he? He does. Yeah, he does. in that it's, case, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay, like, the poking didn't work yeah, on the Josh Allen. Didn't work. He does. Is Josh Allen uh, too much of a scrambler? No, because it works. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, boom. So, which quarterback is in Ron? Uh, Russell Wilson. Yeah. There you go. Well, it also feels like you're just jumping on Russ because he's down right now. It's well, I like, it. well, I, well, he went from you know the Pacific Northwest, much like Enron. Yeah, he's doing kind of. with the the Portland. I just <laughs> I think if you were to compare compare an NFL quarterback to in run, Russell Wilson's not a bad example. I would compare Russell Wilson more to like FedEx because I feel like I feel like it'll tick back up. Just I give f- it some time. But f- I was gonna say Flacco because no 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 no, no. Flacco but Flacco's just, still kind of producing. He's kicking. I, Flacco, ha- no, Flacco is GameStop. 
Yes. Flacco was yes. had a, a late resurgence. Flacco was yeah. fucking massive a while yeah. ago. Went completely away. Yeah. Nobody knew what was no, happening. That is yeah. And then all of a sudden, people are like, yo, Joe Flacco, Joe Flacco, Joe Flacco. He won a crazy fucking game last week. No disrespect, Mad Dog. Now everyone's talking about Joe Flacco. But it's also kind of like we're in on the joke with Joe. It has like, to, it we has realize to, it's not going to stick around. Enron has to be somebody that was good, but like fraudulently yeah, yeah. so, like Who's carried by a defense and then yeah. fell off precipitously like, quickly. I had a theory that Patrick Mahomes would really struggle without Tyreek Hill. And if he had struggled and been doing badly, he'd be Enron, but he's not. Yes. This is actually, I think, a Colin Coward segment. I can yes. him directly to, to stocks. <laughs> if it's not, it should be. It will be within the month. Um, but yeah, okay, so good good question. Kirk Cousins? Kirk Cousins. Mm, yeah, he keeps getting paid. He, yeah, he's, he's, eva- never... he's evaluated his evaluated value is very high. I think but he's not performing. Sam Bradford. I, mean, I have Sam, one. Sam Bradford is in Ron. Who? Because he never Sam, follow me on this one. Sam Bradford never did anything to make you want to give him money or exchange for like, draft picks, but he kept getting traded for other first round draft picks. He you kept just moving him around. And and the first rounders kept going from city to city to city, and he was just he never actually brought anything of value. There is a quarterback who got to a Super Bowl with a pretty good defense, uh, an yeah. offensive system that but hadn't he, been really figured out yeah, yet. But now he's back in the driver's seat. Um, and then was out of the league pretty quickly after that. Oh no, you're thinking of someone else. Who are you thinking of? Garoppolo. Oh no, you're thinking of uh, uh, Dilfer. What was that? It's a cap. Yeah. Kaepernick? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you think Kaepernick's in Ron? That's a spicy take. There are some interesting similarities. Are there? I I would like to I want you to be right about this because this is a fantastic. Uh, I mean, it's line it's, of it's just what I described. I need, I, I need it's a not a timeout. You get I'm just going. See ya. You okay. could have just done that. Yeah. Billy's going to go pee, guys. Billy's bathroom break is being brought to you by Concrete. Uh, here's a myth. Creatine is a type of steroid. Here's a fact. Creatine is a natural molecule that your body produces, and it's present in various foods because your body needs more than it makes. I was actually at the gym today, and I tried doing bench press for the first time since I hurt my elbow. I felt like a schmuck. You want to know why? Because I didn't take any of my concrete. And you can notice when you're at the gym. Billy, I know you feel the same way. You can tell when you've taken your creatine beforehand when you can't. It's a different workout. Your pump is better, your recovery is better, and it's just overall, you're building your muscle way better. It's a more enjoyable experience if you've taken your creatine, and the best creatine in the world to take, in my opinion, is concrete creatine, because it is uh, the number one bioavailable creatine with 70% greater plasma uptake than standard creatine monohydrate. So that's what we talk about. It's This is microdosing creatine. You take one small scoop per 100 pounds of body weight, and it's way better than the creatine that maybe you've used in the past, the creatine monohydrate that bloats you up. And uh, it made me crap myself. I'll just be straight up honest with you. Like I took some creatine one time, and I was basically on the toilet for a day. That's the creatine monohydrate. That's the stuff you don't want to use. This is vastly superior. I use it. Billy uses it. Creatine is absolutely required for functional energy in every cell of your body. Your muscles need creatine to perform optimally and grow stronger. Take control of your health, your, both your body and your mind. Build a better you with concrete. Register now at con-cret.com slash podcast. That's con-cret.com slash podcast. Receive free membership to Planet Fitness for an entire year plus a $500 Walmart Visa gift card. Available now online and in store at Walmart. Concrete is truly life changing and performance enhancing. We love creatine. We love concrete. Concrete is the best creatine in the world. I'm not just saying that. It's the only kind that I take. I swore off creatine until concrete came in as a sponsor. I was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Not that old stuff that's going to make me bloat. This is effective, gives you better workout, it makes you think better too. I like concrete a lot. I think you guys will as well. Billy's bathroom break was brought to you by concrete. Just so everyone knows. It's gonna time you. Kaepernick as in Ron. Hmm. You think he's a fraud though? Not necessarily a fraud. He he had success on the back of a system that was designed specifically around him that nobody had figured out yet. Yeah. And uh that team was really good around him. They got to a Super Bowl, didn't win. 
Yeah. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, he was never to be heard from again for other reasons, but well, kind of. Oh, so now, you're, no, yeah, you just said Colin Kaepernick got blackballed by the NFL. <sighs> well, no, his talent wasn't enough to outweigh his baggage. No, but you just said for other reasons. There so were he other still reasons. be in the league if it weren't for. No, no, no. He has the talent to be a backup quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. The baggage that would come with that after the things that he chose to do is probably not worth a team signing him, similar to, say, a Tim Tebow. Yeah, he, he definitely should have played football uh, from this. Like, he's a much better quarterback than Tim Tebow. Sorry, Nick, if you're listening, please just continue to skip this part. Um, that's Nick Adams, by the way. Yeah. But uh, Colin Kaepernick, I think they're – there, there's definitely something to the idea that he's not a backup quarterback because you have to have him in a system that is unique from a lot of other quarterbacks in the NFL because he's so talented with his legs. Um, so he's not – guys like him aren't necessarily great backup quarterbacks because you have to have, like, two playbooks. Um, but he's ta certainly talented enough to have gotten many other chances when you look around the league and see who else is getting chances. I think we can agree on that. Yes, he is better than some quarterbacks who have signed contracts in the NFL. But it's like anything. Yeah. If you have additional things that go along with signing you, your talent needs to exceed your baggage. Deshaun Watson's talent exceeds his baggage. If he was not talented, he would not have signed a huge contract. I don't know that his baggage... His baggage is also like way, way bigger. Correct. Like, like, yes, he did if, bad things. Do you think that Deshaun Watson... It's different, obviously. Deshaun was coming off of a pretty decent year, like statistically. Colin wasn't really. So, but but before that, prior to that down year, prior to his injury, Kaepernick at his peak was, I'd say, close to being as good a, as Deshaun at his peak. Now he did. I don't necessarily agree with that. Oh, but dude, you need to you need to watch the playoff. He games was good against the Packers for for an, a nine game stretch in that year. It was twenty twelve. I mean, he had two really nice, good. nice like the play consecutive playoffs. He was really good, but um, it's not a bad comparison. I think that a, a nap comparison would also be Enron is the Legion of Boom. You know, in when, Seattle, because follow me on this one, and that was Billy's voice back from a P. Uh, they exploited some of the rules about hey, let's just grab and hold on every single play. Let's play so physical because they can't catch us if we do it all the time. So they egregiously bent the rules. They were very aggressive. They were good at it. They were damn good at it. Uh, and they had some success. They won a Super Bowl. And then it all came crumbling down after they lost that other Super Bowl in, in uh, notable fashion. Fr fraudulent prescriptions? Fraudulent prescriptions, for sure. They were doing a lot of Viagra and, and Adderall. Adderall. Hell, know, of a, hell of a combination he, right there. Here's my one statement on Kaepernick. Okay. Can't wait. Yeah. I think the biggest blow to his career was when he was talking up Che Guevara and then got stopped by Kiko Alonso in Miami by a Cuban and to end the game. And uh, I think that was just such a blow that he like the Cubans were going nuts after that. They were. They like wanted him dead. And yeah. Kiko Alonso was the hitman. Yeah. He became a cliche Guevara. Yeah. yeah. Good point, Billy. Um, so that was Billy's one opinion on Colin Kaepernick was that Kiko Alonso hit was awesome. I mean, like maybe Kiko Alonso wouldn't have been trying so hard to chase you down if you didn't like glorify people like an oppressive regime that like caused all the like, Che Guevara family. contained multitudes. I mean, like just backing that whole. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna both sides the uh, the Castro regime, although they. They had good good health care there in Cuba. And I think like a 99% literacy rate. A lot of other bad stuff obviously killed a lot of people, uh, displaced most of the countryside, and was a, a very bad genocidal dictator. No, you should go live there. It sounds great. Yeah. It sounds like you're really talking it up. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm doing the, the Billy, the trains ran on time. But I never said that. <laughs> uh, Literally, when you're, when you're doing Mount, uh, Mount Rushmore, you try to down, like shit on other people's picks. I just was you, really clumsy. Billy, you, you did say at one point, like, I was just giving orders as your excuse, which is not. No, I did not. Yes, that's not a valid excuse. The, I, was I just never said that. The, I was just giving orders excuse has never been. I never said that. Never been even attempted in a court of law, <laughs> <laughs> much less successful. 
So, uh, oh, back to Enron. Unless anybody ha- else has an idea for a quarterback that could be considered Enron. I've been trying to think. I just can't really think of a, a one that fits all my criteria. Or a basketball player. Is there a basketball player that could be considered Enron? Linsanity? Yeah. I don't know. He was just like kind of a f- flash in the pan moment. I don't think there was anything fraudulent about him. You can't be. That's the thing in the NBA. You can't. You can't fraudulently put up a shitload of points, right? Right, but he did eventually get figured out. Yeah, they figured him out. So and then fell off quickly. Yeah. Um, Although he, I mean, he played in the league for a long time after that. Brady Anderson. I don't know who that is. You don't know Brady Anderson, baseball player. He hit the the only thing people talk about with Brady Anderson, which is kind of unfair, is that he hit fifty home runs during the steroid year. Baseball, baseball is is a much better one to do this with because they're I, I feel like we need to take the fraudulent part out of it because that like how do you, how are you good fraudulently? Uh like Jeff Francoeur looked like when I was a kid, I thought Jeff Francoeur was going to be Babe Ruth. And then he just I mean, took a nosedive. Mm-hmm. Love him in the Braves booth, though. He's very good as an analyst. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of baseball players who for a year are incredible and then fall off. Yeah. I feel like that's the... Baseball's the hardest sport to be good at for a long time. It is, because I think in baseball, you can... you you can It's the streakiest sport. Right. So if you get into a good headspace and you're feeling good and you're confident, you can put up... There are such things as like crazy outlier years in baseball. Um, even though it's the biggest sample size over the course of a year, um, there are crazy outlier years just because you're in the zone, and sometimes it has nothing to do with steroids or or anything else, and then you just kind of go back to sucking after a while. I've kind of felt in of. the zone today. Have you? Yeah. All right. Let us know. Has Billy been in the zone? I, I've been feeling super focused. I got a great workout in this morning. Yeah. Just been buzzing. Billy's been buzzing. Uh, What's the moon like? Good question. So – Probably about to be full. Hmm. All right. So, what else do we have for the downfall of of Enron Billy? Um. So, really, uh, it was really terrible because people's retirement funds, especially those working for the company who had put all of their four hundred one k money into the stock, went from. Uh, I think one guy in the movie talked about how it went from you know forty five k to uh, twelve hundred dollars in overnight because they froze everyone's asset assets they were bankrupting people and people lost their whole retirements and that's that sucks yeah so there was um there was a question about like how does enron make money and they couldn't explain how they couldn't provide a balance sheet yeah so they couldn't provide a balance sheet and then in in an earnings call there was uh somebody from the wall street journal and they're like hey how come you can't why can't you provide a balance sheet? You're a fi- is, like you're a financial company and you can't provide a balance sheet. This is, this is crazy. And then Skilling, his response was just, uh, thank, all right, thanks very much, asshole. asshole. Called him an asshole. Which, and then everybody at the company started like cheering when they heard that. They're like, great job. But it's like you didn't, you, you didn't provide a balance sheet. Also, that's a nerd move. Yeah. What? To be like calling someone an asshole and then everyone that you work for being like, oh, yeah, that's so funny. Like, yeah, that's how you know that you're in you're in a fraudulent line of business. That's what happened with Elizabeth. I Holmes. was just gonna say that. Right, they started right. doing the the fuck you carry rue. Yeah. Also, Enron leads into how Elizabeth Holmes got her start. You know what? You How's know what? that? And her dad worked for Enron. Oh, I oh, forgot. Yeah. Her dad was a VP at Enron. I forgot. So that. this is what we should do. We should take the SEC uh, and whatever regulatory government body that regulates all this shit. And we should just make it a bunch of bullies. Like, just impl- like if you find out who's the big bully at Bill Gates' school, like who's like, and just make them like bullies to keep these nerds in check to remind them mm-hmm. that they're just nerds. Humble beginnings. Yeah. 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 There should be more bullying as adults. I yeah. Agree. Like, just totally like 100%. send them into all these like Silicon Valleys. Ryan and just, Whitney. Yeah. Yeah. Just have them walk just, around and just bully the shit out of them so that they don't act up and start like, yeah, they, it's like, Napo- like kind of like a Napoleonic complex type mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Like I think they, that's a good idea. I think every fortune 500 company should have like a, a mandatory audit, a bully audit, a VP right. of bullying per year. I mean, no, right, no yeah. it's, it's got, it's an outsider. I think so. It's a, it's a mandatory audit. You get Ryan Whitney to show up and you, you distribute a pamphlet with that fucking mugshot of his that he has. Where he just looks like the biggest asshole in the world. I love Ryan Whitney, by the way. Um, and you just send Wit into like a board meeting. 
He hangs out and just dummies you. Just yeah. like beats you up, like gives you wedgies, hangs the CEO oh, you from think the you, door you think by you're your s- underwear. Smart guy? You think you're a smart guy? Smart guy? You think you're a smart guy? You think you're a smart guy, huh? Fucking pigeon. How about them apples? <laughs> yeah. It's in biz and wit. That's what they should do. Biz and wit should just go coast to coast to every hockey enforcer. Just the SEC should hire them. I agree. Uh Avery. You work with the Chicklets guys a lot. Mm-hmm. You think that you think that Wit would be down? Like, if you just sent Wit into a boardroom as a consultant, and you're just like, "Hey, look at these fucking nerds. I want you to make sure that they're not thinking that they're cool because they're not." Yeah. You, you think Wit could just go in there and chew them up? Whitney, there'd have to be golf involved. Like, there'd have to be some sort of golf trip involved in that aspect. Oh, he has to go golfing with the CEOs and the high-powered people. And yep. So they don't feel too hot shit. Yeah. If you put Whitney on the golf course, he'll do anything, and Biz will. For sure, say yes. Okay. Yeah, I like that. This is, it's Boo, a, we just solved it's a good corporate idea. corruption. On be, on behalf of of the taxpayers, I think that this is actually there is a kernel of truth to this too. Where if you give nerds money, they're going to do something. That, well, they that's, think they can commit crimes. Nerds never commit crimes. Yeah. So if you give nerds money, they're going to think that they own the world. They're going to think that they're cool, and they're not, and they're going to get themselves into a shitload of trouble. Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna cheat on their wives with strippers. Mm-hmm. Do you also think that nerds do this a lot? Like, in regards to Enron and I guess Elizabeth Holmes, nerds do this and get in so much trouble later in life because they didn't get in trouble earlier in life, and so they don't know how to get themselves out of trouble. You know what I noticed? That nerds actually did get away with a lot more because they were never the target of authoritarian. They were under the radar. Script fuel. Yeah. That's actually a good point, Billy. Like, if you think back to high school, there were guys that were always, uh, they were always on the radar of the administration. The class right? clown. The usual suspects mm-hmm. were usually in the crosshairs. And so they never had the feeling of having to look over their shoulder. One, they weren't breaking the rules that often. But two, no one ever suspected them of like, doing anything. They probably, yeah, actually, like no one... Like, they don't have the fear, the same fear of getting caught sometimes that people that have been caught before typically have. Hmm. And so then they become an adult and they have all this pent up. I don't know if aggression is the right rebellion. word. Rebellion. Rebellion. Are they? I don't know if it's even insecurity. Yeah. Insecurity. It's yeah. like it, it's they it's want they want to feel like they're the man because they've yeah. never been the man before. And now all of a sudden. They have a position of power. They kind of are the man. And a BMX bike. And a B- and so then they just do shit like this and, and pour gasoline all over themselves mm-hmm. and say, well, I'm not going to get caught. Yeah, when you always come home and smell like gasoline, like what the f- Yeah, it's not. I think- How much are you filling up? I mean, I mean, she got she divorced him in the end. He's probably driving a, a pretty big car. I also bet there was just like kind of an unwritten agreement there. If he drove a Hummer, it would make sense. Do you think? Yeah. Do you yeah. think he, he probably did? He probably went out and bought a Hummer just to have an excuse to stop driving. What if the had, opposite of, of Blake Bortles he, buying a Tesla to stop dipping? Yeah. What if he had a perfume bottle just full of filled with gasoline? So he just got his car. That'd be smart. Yeah. So he did not have to spill it on him. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the moral of the story is like there should be bullies for adults sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. 100%. Um, so anything else that we want to... Oh, Arthur Anderson. We haven't talked about Arthur Anderson. Yeah. So Arthur Anderson uh, was... I think they were one of the big... Like, five. Big five, yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the biggest accounting firms in the United States, and they would get called in to do audits on, on various companies. They were so close with uh, Enron, and they were so fraudulent with how they were dealing with Enron. Again, another case of entertaining clients because Enron was such a massive client of theirs where uh, they ended up, they went completely bankrupt, right? They went completely out of business Mm -hmm. because they were so closely tied into Enron. Um, And they were, they helped Enron get away with a lot of shit where, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal was reaching out, asking all these questions. They would just get pointed over to Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson would help them lie about everything. And again, boom, everything was a house of cards and then got fucked. Um, in about 2001, the stock started taking a downturn, uh, skilling resigned and sold $33 million, uh, worth of Enron shares. So that's pretty good. He got a a nice little chunk of change out of that, uh, pretending to know he knew that the company was going down. The stock started to go down when skilling got out. And he was like, you know what? Uh, hopefully I'll be gone for a while. And by the time the company completely collapses, 
nobody will blame me because it'll been, you know, a year or two since I've left. Turns out everybody just remembered, oh, yeah, that guy, he was in charge of everything. So um, he's definitely responsible for it. So then they got a credit rating downgrade and then the company just collapsed. They laid everyone off. They went bankrupt November 28th, 2001. So they got reduced to a junk status from all the credit agencies. And really all it takes is one to say like, hey, we're not in anymore. And then at that point, it's a confidence game. And then every other credit company out there sees the one downgrade and they start thinking to themselves, wait, what are their reasons for downgrading? Let's take a closer look. Oh yeah, they might be onto something. Um, and that's, that's kind of what the Enron executives blamed. They actually kind of did a cancel culture thing after the fact. They were like, yeah, well, it was just, you know, the media said something. And then one credit agency said something and then everybody else kind of piled on. So Enron claimed that they got canceled, but they actually just weren't making any money at all. So yeah, then everybody lost all their jobs, lost all their money. Stock price went down into the toilet and um, that's pretty much it. And now for how Enron did 9-11. Okay, Billy. <laughs> no. Uh, so as we, so this is, this is like a hypothetical Let's just call it historical fiction. Um, so, uh, speaking about that, uh, Enron's collapse was actually right around the time of 9-11. And I actually was doing a lot of like research. I was trying to see like how that, that may have impacted it. We all know like, you know, the, there was a lot of interest in the war uh, in Iraq around oil, energy. And if we're thinking about it, like this is this is all Enron was into. So, it's like... Like if you watch the documentary, Bush, Cheney, everyone's involved. I mean, Bush at one point was sending, I guess what uh, today we would call a cameo to one of the leaving. Do you remember that? Yeah, I didn't <laughs> think of it as a cameo, but that's exactly. Like what it I was. didn't know they did cameos back then. I yeah. was like, what? This is like the early two thousands. Also, early two thousands officially long time ago. Yeah, I was watching that and I was like, holy shit, that's like old. Yeah, the, it, it when you see like the the lack of high def on on the footage it's really stark and, and the baggy suits yeah like the, the fashion is a little bit different back then this documentary came out in 2005 and they're talking about all these these events taking place in 2000 and 2001 i was like this looks like it was made in 1993 yeah i was like is this the 80s and all yeah all the women with like the perms and the sport coats and the yeah. big lipstick it you're right billy this did this makes me feel old because I was alive in this 2000. This makes me feel old. Yeah. Because that like. You don't remember that though. I don't remember. Well, I was. Well, I don't remember it, but like that time period, I was like that, like, like looking back on that, I was like, there's definitely been a change, like a, a decade type change between now and then. Like yeah. it was, you know how we can all differentiate like the seventies from the sixties from the eighties and the nineties. Mm -hmm. And then like you're alive and then you're like oh it's all blurring like i'm looking at the 2000s i'm like that's a decade that's yep. like that's got its own spin it's got its own vibes like the music in the documentary had its own vibes i was like whoa like this is actually old uh but anyway back to 9-11 uh so there's a conspiracy theory that the bush cheney and the much gossip about energy task force convened daily with high priority means to try and engineer a bailout for uh, Enron, who is Bush's most generous generous campaign contributor. So it was at the peak of the Enron scandal. And uh, what they were trying to do is they thought that they could make the Indian power plant profitable by connecting it to a like a energy gas pipeline in the Caspian Sea. But to do that, you had to go over Afghanistan and that would undermine Iraqi energy production and oil production, and then also like pick up uh, natural gas in Afghanistan. And that was how the Enron, and that's how they were going to bail out Enron by giving all the contracts to Enron. Uh, pretty far fetched connection, but you know it's it's uh, you know funny, like it's interesting to think about because. No, that's the connection between Enron and 9-11, something that happened very close to each other and involved a lot of the same players. But that's it's crazy there hasn't been more connections. Like people have spun up. That is crazy. Like people have connected. We're all, all waiting for you to do it. Yeah, I, I'll write a little. But like, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah, Billy, really, really dive deep into that. All right, that was Enron. That was Enron. That was Enron. I think we did a pretty good job on that. I think we have a lot of facts. Oh, good. A lot, a lot of facts. facts out there. Okay. There's, uh, and they have the best merch ever. Yeah, so uh, Mad Dog, how do you feel about your, your appreciation of Enron merch? So, okay. So I actually was thinking about this when I was watching the documentary, and I was like, okay, these are really, really, really bad guys. Still got good merch, though. Like, I, I can't deny it. Mm-hmm. They have a good logo. Go buy the Enron macro shirt in the Varsal store. Use code PFT or no, Big no. T or Billy. Use code Jake. Or no, Jake. no use Big code, T, the other code. Actually, you know what? You know what? Shiny spyware use, on your computer. Use code Kate because <laughs> Kate's code actually Kate. been grinding her ass off herself and has gotten to the number one spot without any other. She got a stripper to go into the yak. Which, and, which is against the rules. I don't know if you checked your email yeah. recently. Yeah, wasn't supposed to do Big that. man upstairs said, bad. Oh, really? It was strippers in the <laughs> office. We were happy this company. I know. Wait, it's bullshit. But they have good merch. And the, when Jake said Enron Field, I've done some digging on eBay to try to find vintage Enron stuff. And there's not a ton of like authentic Enron merch, but there's a lot of Enron Field merch, weirdly enough. Oh, and I almost bought an Enron Field merch a couple weeks ago. But I like good that. merch. Bad people know how to do some some good marketing and they've got me 20 years later but yeah fuck them though fucking ron and we will see you in Bunch not use nerds. use code billy uh to buy oh. merch do you want to do voicemails should we do voicemails Please. yeah let's do some. some oh yeah sure um okay ready What's up, man? Cardoso, it's Joe from Ohio. Fuck the Browns. Uh, just had to get that off my chest. But I got a question for y'all. It's kind of weird. Um, so what or who is the most problematic person that your hometown claims? You know what I mean? Like, okay, this guy was lived here. This famous guy lived here. Like, me, I live in Stowe, where Larry Zonka grew up and played. And I know that there's nothing really official, but, I mean, Larry Zonka's got to be problematic, right? And I work in Ashtabula, where... Legendary Urban Myers from mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's slightly problematic. So yeah, fuck the Browns. Have a great day. Stay handsome, Avery. You're the hottest. Bye. Hey, wow. Avery, let's go. That's nice. Getting some shine. I'll tell you what. I'll give you one. Uh, Brian Cushing is from my hometown. Oh really? Yeah. It's a pretty problematic guy. Is he? No. He, yeah. he just he just liked the sauce. Who's Brian Cushing? The sauce is problematic, though, for some people. Who's Brian Cushing? Brian Cushing's best friend. Yeah, he, he was on Arian's team. Why is he bad? He just took he's some not, steroids. No, he's not bad. He's not bad. Mine is uh, pretty easy. I'm from Old Hickory, Tennessee, which is named for, do you know who Old Hickory was? Uh, Andrew Jackson. That's yeah. correct. The president. Uh, yeah, and it's right next to Hermitage, Tennessee, which is where his home, the Hermitage, was. Uh, so I guess he's slightly problematic for some of the things he did under his tenure yeah he uh killed a lot of people that's what some say some would say genocide again it's the way they wrote the books (laughs) uh billy most problematic person from new york (laughs) from new york yeah um trump jeffrey epstein yeah yeah epstein well epstein's not well he's from all boroughs? Yeah. Yeah. I was born in the city. Grew up in... Actually, let me look something up. Mine are the Paul brothers, Jake and Logan Paul. Uh, typhoid Mary. Okay. That's a pretty bad one. That's a pretty bad one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. My hometown. We didn't have... A, we had a, like a bank robber. But you didn't have like a... You didn't have like a notorious like celebrity from your area? No, not really. Like Grant Hill. I don't know who that is. The DC sniper? Wait, you, DC don't, sniper. you don't know who Grant Hill was? No. Who's Grant Hill? That's too bad. You don't are you're or you're kidding. Wait, wait. I you know don't know who Grant, Grant Hill the, is. The basketball player? Yeah. Yeah. Why is he problematic? He's not at all. He's no, like he was least, he's he, gra- he's goaded. Yes, he's the least problematic yeah. person ever. Mm-hmm. There was a guy that robbed the bank from my hometown. Oh, MS thirteen. Don't know. Who the entire is. organization. No, that's yeah, that's tough. Aren't they from Central America? El Salvador, but yeah. What's MS thirteen? It's a gang. it's a gang from El Salvador. Oh. Mara Salvatuca. Wait, but you're what? How they they? My my hometown, my street in particular, was like ground zero for MS13 when it first started popping up in the United States. 
It was like my street and then the city of Los Angeles were the two hot spots where it started. <laughs> Gangs of New York? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Alabama Drive, man. You don't want to fuck with Alabama Drive. Did they like you? Uh, yeah, I guess. Like They didn't really have an opinion on me. They just kind of let me... I did my thing. They did theirs. <laughs> Where did did people call you Elf Boy when you were younger? No, I called myself that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did people call me Elf Boy? <laughs> no. I've, I've no. literally never. I just said. No, it's I, Elf Boy. I thought I looked like an elf. I got I got a gringo. You know. That sort of thing. It was mutual respect. They just knew when I was coming down the street. I was going to make my way to the McDonald's breakfast buffet. They weren't going to hurt me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, what? We had, a McDon we had a McDonald's breakfast buffet. I didn't whoa. even know that was a thing, whoa. period. I don't think it is a thing, except my McDonald's had Did one Did you have a knockoff up. McDonald's? No, it was a legit McDonald's. You're what? kidding. Prove yeah. it. Like, <laughs> so it, I don't think, I've never been to another McDonald's that had a breakfast buffet. I don't think there it. is another McDonald's. It, it, it was only on Saturday or Sunday morning, so it was like a weekend thing, and it was super cheap. I want to say it was like, Three ninety nine. Oh. The brief and magical history of fast food buffets. Wait, yeah. So you would go and there would be like unlimited pan hot cakes and sausages yeah. and stuff. Hot cakes, sausages, eggs, hash browns, hash browns. Oh, buddy. I mean, I could put down if there was unlimited McDonald's hash browns, I could get to twenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, twenty of them. I think you could too. Oh Fucked. my god! It was great. So yeah. Um, was, uh, wait, are you finding? Are you fact checking me on this, Billy? Yeah. No, no, no. It definitely did exist. Yeah. But it just wasn't profitable, and it got yeah, no, no shit. No shit. <laughs> Most uh, well, yeah, no shit. But we're, yeah, but and also it wasn't hygienic. Yeah, also, also no, no shit. shit. <laughs> but like buffets exist. Yeah, like, but it's not like no one's ever made the them two work. most obvious things about a McDonald's buffet. Yeah, <laughs> need to bring back the Pizza Hut buffet. I love. Oh yeah, the there was there was one. Oh, left. Can we go to a buffet this weekend? Sure. All right. I, I just realized I haven't been to a buffet in such a long time. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. I was just, there was one left in Nashville, and I don't know if it's reopened after COVID. Damn. I haven't Their pudding been back. was so good. A pizza buffet? Pizza the, buffet? The Pizza Hut buffet was just go to. I dipped the breadsticks in the pudding. That's so gross oh, of God. me. What? Can we, can we make a quick, like, You're disgusting. Can we quick make a quick list of stuff we're going to do to I'll, eat? Like There's a place called Waffle Austin's House. Steak and Homestyle Buffet. You heard of it? Never oh, a homestyle buffet. Ugh. It's, not, you know, it's in I'd much rather, if, if we're gonna go to like a shitty but great restaurant, I'd much rather go to Waffle House. Than, yeah, 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 no, yeah. yeah. definitely. We've got to hit Waffle House. It's yeah. right next to our hotel and cookout. This mm -hmm. place is in Knoxville, and it says it's the best. Someone said it's the best steak I've ever had in my life. Mm. Best steaks, best steaks. I guess we got. I feel try like that spot. We can make a we can make a list, Billy. They have mm. froyo too. Huh. Steak and Froyo. Wow. Yo, did any of you guys ever go to the buffet, like buffets with the, is it Froyo or is it ice cream that you like? That's Froyo. That's Froyo? Well, it depends. There's two different ones. Like that like or vanilla. soft serve. It's like vanilla soft serve. Soft serve or frozen yogurt. Oh, I go comes out of the nuts same at those. I always got in trouble for putting my, my mouth underneath <laughs> one and just putting it directly <laughs> into my mouth. I thought it was so cool. Have you been to the one in Kipps Bay? No. Mm. Big T knows what I'm talking about. What in Kipps Bay? Tasty Delight. Oh, I've been there. That place sucks. I love that There's place. a place next to it that's good, though. There's two frozen yogurt places right next to each other. And my girlfriend likes the one that sucks. Mm -hmm. And I like the good nice. one. That's that's tough. Mm -hmm. That's an impossible battle to win. Oh, I win it every time, brother. Don't <laughs> don't underestimate me. Who, guess who's paying for it? You are. Next voice. You're a gentleman. Next voicemail? Yep. And Mac production crew, this is Greg from an undisclosed location. Uh, my question today is, if you guys were to die and go to heaven, and God was there and asked you, what age would you want to spend the rest of eternity as? What age would you pick and why? All right. Stay beautiful, everyone. Stay gorgeous. Especially you, Big T. Appreciate you, King. 19. Right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like 25 I'm, is like the sweet spot. Yep. I'm feeling pretty good. I was now. absolutely hacked at 19. What does that mean? I was like the most jacked I've ever been. That's oh. hacked. <laughs> that is like my ultimate form. I think it's pretty clear that 25 is the right call. Yeah. 25 is good. Cause Wait, we're just talking about our bodies, right? Our minds are still gone through our whole lives. 
Yeah. No, you're, I think your mind is. I think part it's everything. Of, your mind's part of your body. Like, w- would you want to be like a six year old with an adult mind? Well, if you're in no, heaven, no. you're kind of like you, um, yeah, you're um, omnis- so like you just want your best physical specimen of yourself. Yeah, I think twenty five. Twenty five for me. We'll see when we get there, Billy. I was like, f- well, yeah, it might be different for everybody. Or a baby. What? You want to be a baby and have so everyone just everybody carries you and have it. Everybody would like, like, come up to you and be like, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Look how great you are. Not even that, but I feel like if you're a baby in heaven, there's a different spot for you. Slash, I feel like you're kind of not a sentient being. You're kind of just there. You just you, so you want to black out in heaven. I don't know. Wait, but I feel like a baby's not. I, the- I'm confused. So you're at the gates. God's like, how old do you want to be? And, you, and I'm like, you're maybe like, two. Are you choosing your form for the rest of heaven? Because I would want to be my best physical form. But why? What's that going to do? What are you going to do? Lift in heaven? Yeah, you you can do whatever you want in heaven. Yeah, I feel like that is a pretty big part of Billy's paradise. <laughs> no, but like, you know, so you can do physical stuff. You can play sports, right? Again, but you could. It's heaven. You can play sports as a baby. Yeah, but you suck. But you wouldn't because it's heaven. No, you would suck still. No, you'd stop. You because you'd be playing other people in heaven. No one would tackle you. Yeah, but I guess that's not part of my heaven. Like my heaven isn't playing football and hitting max PRs. Is there, can you sin in heaven? No. That's a good question, Billy. I don't think you want to sin in heaven. I think that that's what the response yeah. would be, right? No, I don't think there's a reason to sin in heaven. But everybody's like, sins. what are you scheming? Yeah. I mean, there's no coveting. You can't covet. Just you know, like. Do you still have appetites in heaven? That's a great question. I don't know. I feel like no. Because what if your heaven... That's your physical body. But what if your personal heaven is just a lot of sinning? Well, this actually... uh, This is something I love to think. Like, you just go where the stuff... Like, so for example, like, for some people, the idea of like a gigantic, like, sinful place, which is hell, and some people like, oh, that's fucking fun. Like... yeah. That scene in uh, where's that scene in that movie where they all go to sin? I forget. Um, leaving Las Vegas, Is fear that... and loathing in Las Vegas. No, but like yeah, so like all the crazy stuff, like rock and roll, fire. Like some people, like oh, that's my heaven. Like that's sick. They like do drugs. Connor, and are you talking about shit. Hot Tub Time Machine? Yes, <laughs> yes. Wait, I fig- I was like, that seems like a movie Billy would like. You wait. Is that the one where they like go to the? It's like Craig Robinson. Uh, yeah, yeah. I forget who else was in it, but yeah. Huh. Uh, okay. Well, that was a good question. What else we got? We got one more. Also, twenty five. Just like twenty five, you're you're young, but you're old. Like old enough to be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's the that's the right answer. Yeah. Because if you're younger than twenty, then you're still a kid. People treat you like you're a kid. Or I do my I, junior year of college. I really enjoyed my junior year of college. Like 20, 21, until COVID. Can't wait to go to class on Friday. But like everyone knows you're an adult because you died. That's not how dying works. I know, but you're in heaven, so you're like. All right, let's uh, okay, let's next, keep it going. Next one. Okay, last one. Oh, hey guys, uh, it's Andy from Vermont. Big fan of the podcast. Uh, just listened to the Nano Dose on September twentieth, uh, where you ranked the planets, and Billy was hating on Saturn. Just wanted him to know that. Uh, sharks are actually older than Saturn's rings, so that's pretty neat. Whoa. Um, my question for you all uh, is, if you could take one attribute from another person on the podcast, what would that be? Uh, like, PFT would clearly want Arian's hands. Um, Billy should want Big T's honesty. Remember how when <laughs> Billy wanted to join the podcast, he was like, I'll be the Jamie pulling up the facts and then he became the least factual person on the planet. <laughs> anyway, love you all. I do think about that often, actually. That's a that's a great voicemail. Yeah, that was a good one. That's a that's a solid solid job. Everyone strive to be more like that. Yeah, that is a very, including us in a this very room. Good question. Yeah, if uh-huh. you could take one attribute, hmm. I'd want PFT's um, ability to create one-liners. Yeah, your you your brain neurons Wit. fire You're so fast. Wow. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. That's I my, get, that's I get, my pick though. Uh, so it, you guys pick another one. I get uncomfortable. Uh, Arian speed because I'd be in the NFL. Billy's height because I would then be in the NFL and I would tackle Billy. Not Big T's height. He's taller than me. He's too tall. Mm-hmm. I agree. 
<laughs> six three is the perfect height. Yes, yeah, so I agree. If I could be six, by the way, if I was six three, I would be. Fuck you guys! I would be <laughs> multiple sport hall of famer, easily. Yeah, right. If I was six three, whew, buddy, record book, record books. I would. I wouldn't be with you guys. I'd be in my own trophy room. That's for sure. Uh, I want Arian's money. <laughs> yep. That's a good answer. Yep. Or PFTs. I'd settle for PFT money too. <laughs> that's not a great answer, but Arian, that's a good one. I'd want Big T's ability to commonly win just about everything. Wow, that, yep. that's a that's a high compliment. I mean, it's a common Big T win. That makes sense. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Arian, what would Arian pick? I'm just going to put myself in his brain. And by the way, Arian hasn't been here today. He had some things come up at the last minute, completely outside of his fault, but some responsibilities he had to attend to, um, which are totally fine. And uh, he'll be fine. And he'll be with us this weekend in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. But what would Arian say? He would say, um, hmm. None of us are, are, Big T, are you good enough at video games that he would want your video game ability? <laughs> I'm good at video games that he wouldn't like. Oh, so never mind. Like FIFA? Yeah, I'm good at FIFA. I'm really good at MLB The Show. FIFA? I'm moderately decent at Call of Duty. I think I think Arian would say something like... Billy's youthful energy. I was going to say like Billy's uh, curiosity. Yeah, I was going to say like, yeah. Either curiosity or just his energy. Energy is just like... Having energy is something that you don't... His aura. You, no, no, not like that type of energy. I mean, actually, like, Billy's not really ever tired. You know? Mm -hmm. Billy's got a good battery. My libido? Not your nope. libido. Shut up. Libido <laughs> applies to more than things. If you look at the it? definition I of libido. Yes, libido. I, I think Arian would want your... Just like your battery. Mm. Your battery life. Social battery? Yeah, just... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you get older... I've used that in a much... When you get older, you your battery just drains and, Wait, it, and it never recharges all the way. It's like an iPhone. And so in your 30s, like, yeah, having Billy's ability to just not sleep um, and just always be ready to go and excited to go about different things. Not talking about, like, libido-wise. I thought, wait, no, libido. You take What's too many, other word? You take too many stimulants for working out. I do not want your libido. It's probably non-existent. What? <laughs> Does that hurt your... No, not at all. Oh. Wow, that was a Whoa. that was a quick answer. <laughs> and he thinks the lady doth protest too much, Billy. <laughs> no, it's fine. It actually helps. <laughs> it's normal. Jesus. Okay, uh, so I think that'll that'll do it for macro dosing today. Yeah. We'll see you this weekend in Knoxville, Tennessee, or in Boone, North Carolina, in Spirit. If your spirit's also there, go JMU, go Dukes, Duke Dogs, go Vols. What are the hashtags we're using this weekend? V four L Florida. Fuck Florida. Hashtag fuck Florida. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll be we'll be there. So if you're in Knoxville, let us know. And uh, we love you guys. And we'll see you there.